Welcome to the second day of Future Talk 2020 live from Bern, Switzerland. Good to have you all here. Also, a warm welcome to all our guests watching us online on YouTube or during our event app. My name is Dorothy Gelmar. I'm your host and moderator, and I'm looking forward to guide you through our conference. Yeah, yesterday, we have focused on STEAM and STEM education, and today it is green, also here in our event hall. It's about green education, and we have an action-packed program set up for you, for all our guests here in Bern, but also for you, wherever you are at the moment. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Yeah, if you have already participated in yesterday's event, then you know that this is a hybrid dialogue event where our panelists join us on site here in Bern or via Zoom call from wherever in the world. Yesterday we've been to the Philippines and so on. Um, my name is Dorothy Gelmar. I'm happy to be here and I'm sure we will have a great day all together and interesting talks, interesting panels. We have two panel discussions here, the private sector talk and so on. Yeah, for all of you taking part from the home office or office, if you want to share your thoughts, maybe some statements, or if you have any questions, please use the hashtag FutureTalk2020. Yes, yeah, this is also an interactive event. We want interaction with all of you. If you use YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, please use the comment function for sending us your um, questions, for example, or your statements. If you use the Hoover app, which you can download uh, through our internet uh, web, web page, uh, futuretalk.org, um, there you can also post your questions, and I will hand them over to our panelists uh, at the end of our panel talk. We also have prepared a poll. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and you can check your knowledge there. We will reveal the answers at the end of today. Yeah, now I would say let's start this afternoon with the Vice President of World Deduct, Mr. Nader Imani, and here he is. Hello, Nader. <laughs> Thank you, Doro. Um, excellencies, um, partners, and representatives from the world of politics, business, and education, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the globe. The green economy offers the opportunity for significant growth in societies by working in line with the ecology, not against it. It represents the culmination of sustainable development goals altogether. This statement, could be drawn from evidence of policy progress, as well as the insight of civil society organizations who are tracking environment-friendly measures on the ground. Nonetheless, the worldwide economy is still excessively reliant on fossil fuel-based energy, transport, and carbon-intensive industries. With a large share of, of the world force currently unemployed, these sectors are quite simply failing to secure and create enough jobs. The brown economy model is struggling and does not provide us the sustainability we all need to safeguard the planet we borrowed from the next generations, yet to be born. What will be the aspiration and the robust foundation that the world should have on which to build a green and equitable economy? For the, time, for the first time in COP21 in 2016, worldwide governments, together with the business, trade unions, and civil society organizations, adopted the Paris Agreement on Climate to set a global target for the world, reducing or at least maintaining a global carbon emissions. This has been offering for the first time an opportunity to all countries, particularly the most industrialized ones, the prospect to make the change where economy, ecology, and society match in symbiosis altogether. As a matter of fact, we need governments, all government, governments, to politically support such an accord to transform an agreement to a movement. The recent policy derived by the EU presidency of Mrs. von der Leyen 
that Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050 gives us, the expert technocrats and decision makers, hope for the future and call for actions. Green economy will be an inspirational model for the future and green jobs, the backbone for it. Green skills, or better said, greening skills, are required to create jobs and support the green economy, reflecting the journey we will all need urgently to embark on, making our planet ready for the future, sustainable to regenerate itself. I'm extremely pleased to host our keynote speakers today and our panelists for a future fruitful day on how our education system should be answering the challenge of greening our economy. Thank you for your participation and the great interest. Thanks, Mr. Imani, for the welcoming words. And as you see, we have a safety concept here for all our guests joining us here in Bern. We wear masks, we have the distance, we keep the distance, so we all stay safe and healthy. Let's now move on to our Swiss government representative for the session, Mrs. Liliana Kirchknopf. She is the head of private sector development at the SECO, the Economic Development Corporation of Switzerland, and Liliana is also the co-chair of the Global Donor Committee on Enterprise Development. Hello, Liliana. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, dear Excellencies, uh, dear Ambassador He Rang Kong, dear Director So Young Choi, dear Mr. von Grafenried, Mayor of Bern, experts, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you today, present or virtually, wherever you are, on behalf of the Swiss government to the second day of future talk dedicated to green education in partnership with UNESCO UNEVOC. The COVID context in which we come together is a reminder that there is an urgency in this regard. Switzerland, as many other countries, is committed to the goals of the Paris Agreement to stay below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to thereby fight the threat of climate change. The Parliament has recently adopted a T CO2 law to have a basis for implementing the necessary measures. Emissions should be halved by 2030 and Switzerland is to become climate neutral by 2050. While there is a consensus on the overall goal, the different measures needed are still being disputed by different parties. And therefore, a referendum is likely. That's why today's discussion is so important to identify how we all and together from the public and the private sector can accelerate the green transition by strengthening green education and providing the relevant skills. To have an overall framework is also useful. In Switzerland, the Federal Council has defined a sustainable development strategy, which is aligned with the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. It focuses on consumption and production, energy, climate and biodiversity, and equal opportunities. It is currently being widely consulted before being adopted. This summer, the Swiss government adopted a report and guidelines on sustainability in the financial sector. As we know, the financial sector plays an important role in this respect in the green transition. The aim is to make Switzerland a leading location for sustainable financial services. And it is just this week that the State Secretariat for International Finance has launched the Green FinTech Network. This brings me to my role at SECO, the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, and more precisely at the Economic Cooperation and Development Division. Our mandate is to support our partner countries, mostly middle-income countries, such as South Africa or Indonesia, 
in fighting poverty through growing sustainably and in an inclusive manner. Climate-friendly grow is thereby one of four goals of our current strategy, and we have devoted about a fourth of our funds to it. Furthermore, the goal of more and better jobs has been an important part of SECO's work. Indeed, poor countries, in poor countries, getting a job is one of the main reasons why people are able to rise out of poverty. And to meet this goal, SECO promotes the development of skills with a focus on higher education that improve labor productivity and competitiveness in specific sectors. Climate change is increasingly becoming a factor to consider when developing skills projects. For instance, fr climate-friendly business can create millions of new jobs in the next years. But for this, well-targeted and well-designed support is required to allow businesses to grasp opportunities stemming from climate change. And at the same time, climate change represents a high risk in terms of job destruction, in particular for the most vulnerable. As a response, more and more implementing organizations have started to cover climate or environmental issues embedded in a skills project. The ILO, a key partner of second various projects, has been very active in this area by undertaking relevant research and promoting the greening of enterprises, workplace practices, and the labor market as a whole. And now let me mention some concrete examples of what SECO is doing. We have launched several programs to support greening of the financial sector by providing specific trainings to financial institutions on sustainable finance, ESG risks and aspects, environmental, social, and government aspects, and in general, the design and launch of green financial products. This again has a great impact on the real economy. In Switzerland, Swiss Sustainable Finance has been a strategic partner in this agenda, and we have supported them to establish in 2014. Greening the construction sector is another priority um, of us, as the construction sector accounts for 28% of energy-related greenhouse gases. We have achieved tremendous success by collaborating with the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, as part of the World Bank Group, to create a green building certification system adapted to emerging markets. The EDGE, Excellence in Design for Great Efficiencies system has leveraged more than 4 billion investments from IFC and mobilized financing from other banks for green buildings. SECO's role was to provide seed, fun seed funding for this innovative and system-relevant approach. The support included also close collaboration with universities in order to promote relevant skills in partner countries. My last example concerns South Africa, the Green Skills Project, um, where we support the strategy of the South African government to establish training for qualified skilled labor that is geared towards the need of businesses and industry taking green elements into consideration. Now, going forward, SECO will increasingly mainstream climate change aspects in skills development projects. And we will be aiming at fostering the dualization of the vocational education and training, taking into consideration critical sectors or companies and shifting them through respective curricula and study programs towards a more environmental and climate-friendly production. This may include sectors such as textiles, wood, processing, food, agriculture, or tourism. Our work, uh, let me say, is coordinated with other donors and partners, and we learn from each other and we also complement each other. One mechanism to which we are doing this is the DCD, as has been mentioned, the Donor Committee on Enterprise Development, which I'm co-chairing, and which brings together different donors, um, international organizations and private foundations. And one of the working groups is dedicated to green growth. 
But then there are other fora, um, some we will hear today, and also the Donor Committee for, do for Dual Vocational Education and Training, the DC DVET, focusing on the education and skills development side in German-speaking countries. Today is a great opportunity to hear and get inspired what different countries, international organizations, companies, academia and associations are doing on green education. Mr. von Grafenried, Mayor of Bern from the Green Party, will conclude the day by sharing the views of learning and greening cities approach and hopefully those present uh, physically in Bern will have an opportunity to discover some of these aspects during their stay. Once again, a warm welcome to Bern and to the second day of Future Talk on Green Education. Thank you so much, Ms. Kirchknopf, for these insights in SECO, for your great work for making the world a bit greener and better. Thank you very much for everything. Yeah, let's continue right away with our embassy host of today, Korea, and the ambassador of the Republic of Korea in Switzerland, represented today by Minister Councillor La of the Korean Embassy, joining us live. On behalf of the Embassy of the Republic of Korea in Switzerland, I would like to say that it is a great pleasure an honor for the embassy to participate in the 2020 World Dida Conference Future Talk as a host. Education has always been one of the key pillars for sustainable and inclusive growth, not only for each nation, but also for the entire global community. And I believe that current COVID situation has only accentuated the critical role of education for future growth. Education was instrumental in catapulting South Korea from one of the poorest countries in the world to one of the most advanced nations within a short span of the last 50 years. I'm pleased to note that Korea is number one in the world with 70.4% of high school graduates entering college. Thanks to highly educated and well-trained labor force, Korea had successfully and rapidly transitioned to the second, third, and fourth industrial revolution and now ranks as a ninth largest country in global trade. Mindful of the importance of education for her own sustainable growth, Korea has steadfastly strove to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities, not only for Korean nationals, but also uh, for people around the world. This year alone, Korea is providing 260 million US dollars in overseas development aid on education in order to improve educational facilities and programs, provide vocational training, equipments and materials to various developing countries. Korea is also actively participating in such global educational initiatives as Global Education First Initiative spearheaded by former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Also, UN Academic Input, Impact, as well as the UNDPI NGO Conference, which came up with the Global Education Action Agenda in 2016 during the meeting held in Korea. And I am proud to say that Korea's commitment to improve and enhance education around the world will not cease even during the COVID-19 pandemic. And my embassy's participation in today's conference is another example of such dedication. I'd like to thank all the participants and staff for making the conference possible. And I'm certain that this event will lay a lasting impact 
on future of education and sustainable growth. Thank you. Mr. Councillor La of the Korean Embassy, thank you so much. UNIVOC is UNESCO's designated center for technical and vocational education and training, TVET, and we are looking forward to the director of UNESCO UNIVOC, Zhu Yang Choi. Distinguished guest participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you in Europe and good morning and good evening to those joining from other parts of the world. First, I would like to thank World Didac for inviting UNESCO UNEVOC to this conference, focus on the impact that education can make on the transition to green and inclusive growth. It is our pleasure to partner with you in organizing a session on green education, which is one of our priorities, and we look forward to our continuing collaboration in the future. Today, I would like to highlight some pedagogical issues facing green education for Tibet and the implication of COVID-19 and digitalization on the topic. I hope that they serve as a good food for thought and a background for the discussions scheduled today with the panelists and the audience. First of all, something special about Tibet and green education. These two topics have one thing in common. That is that they both are shared responsibilities of many different actors and stakeholders. Coordinating different actors and stakeholders has been the main challenge both for Tibet and for green education respectively. Now imagine the complexity of the coordination issue when it comes to green education for Tibet combined. Green education for Tibet is the job of many, not only educational institutions, but also workplaces, not only the government sector, but also the private sector, not only the education ministries, but also the ministries responsible for environment, economy, trade, and or industry. But this multi-sectoral ownership can also mean that green education for Tibet runs the risk of becoming the job of nobody. Countries have set up all kinds of coordination mechanisms to prevent the fragmentation. According to a 2019 ILO study, countries in fact have been relatively successful in setting up the mechanisms and frameworks for intersectoral collaboration and coordination to promote green skills. But both developed and developing countries fall far short of implementing actions or monitoring the impact of their actions on green skills. Action, that is the word that matters most when it comes to green education for Tibet. UNESCO looked into the question of how a sustained real action for greening or sustainable development is undertaken by individuals. Action for greening or sustainable development does not happen simply by acknowledging the need for greening, developing well-intentioned policies and mechanisms, or introducing the state-of-the-art delivery means. The real and sustained actions for greening requires a transformation, a fundamental change in the entity's belief and value system. Such a disruptive change does not happen for no reason, unless there is something impacting the entity's own life existence or survival. For green education for Tibet to be effective, it has to be intrinsically linked to one's life. It has to bear relevance to one's livelihood. This is where green voices are excited about the rare window of opportunity created inadvertently by COVID-19. People and institutions all of a sudden have been thrown into a world where they experience, among others, the viability of living, working, and learning differently, in other words, digitally, in a less carbon-intensive manner. Some governments, like South Korea and Australia, have announced concrete measures to make their COVID-19 recovery process much greener. Some companies have made a bold decision to transition towards digital workplaces, either completely or partially. With the COVID-19, actions have taken place in a way that was never imagined to be possible. It was possible because we experienced something that we can verify in our own lives. 
ironically, this is where the biggest challenge lies for green education to be delivered effectively in a digital manner. To begin with, TIVET, which often requires a practical in-person training, is uniquely challenging to deliver via digital platforms. In order to deliver green education for TIVET, Digitally, it must be contextualized. It has to touch upon the immediate green need of the community of the learners, the particular green skills required in the community, the particular green industrial networking available in the community. Otherwise, green education for TVET delivered digitally can be far removed from the reality in which the learners are based. Even if all these recommendations are honored for green education for Tibet to be delivered effectively via digital means there is one particular challenge that is quite daunting to overcome. That is the greening is one of the areas where we have the most serious competency issue for teachers. And now the problem is further compounded by the teacher's urgent training need for digital delivery. I understand that there will be a discussion today on digitalization and its impact on and promises for green education. In doing so, let's not forget about the Tibet teachers being called upon to rapidly pick up all the new learnings and deliver the necessary future-oriented training to their students. Thank you, and I wish you a very successful discussion. We live in a complex, fast-changing world. Poverty, inequality, unemployment, health threats, and environmental degradation are just some of the challenges that we face. So where do we start tackling these challenges? We must start with the people. People need to be equipped to anticipate and tackle new challenges in their environment and contribute to providing solutions in the society. And how do we achieve this? Lifelong learning is a crucial way of empowering people. Learning unlocks people's potential to create a sustainable future and a life of dignity. Providing people with a broad array of learning opportunities throughout their lives equips them with the skills and values that they need. Where do people learn? Cities have a relatively compact nature a high population density, and a tight network of learning facilities at their disposal. Cities have tremendous potential to motivate and enable citizens to learn. Learning cities ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Cities promote inclusive learning from basic to higher education. They revitalize learning in families and communities. They facilitate learning in the workplace. They extend the use of modern learning technologies. Learning cities foster a culture of learning throughout life. They make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Learning cities lay the foundation for sustainable economic, social and environmental development. Wow, what an emotional video. Thank you for that. And also thanks for your encouraging words, Minister Councillor La of the Korean Embassy. No, that's not right, Mrs. Su Joy. I'm so sorry. The di Director of the UNESCO Univoc. So 
Let's now go on with our next speaker, a gentleman who joined us already yesterday and thrilled us, the whole uh, people here around and also in front of our uh, cameras, um, the futurist Mr. Leonard. He thrilled us with his forecast concerning the STEM education in the era of the new normal. And today, he will focus on green education. Here he is. Hi, it's Gerd Leonhardt, Futurist again, with a second session for Future Talks in beautiful Bern. I hope you had a good time yesterday and I gave you some food for thought. Today, I'm going into the second session to talk about what I sometimes call the green futures and how that hangs together with education. So let's dive right in. First, as I said yesterday, you know, we are approaching uh, another wave of reality, which is beyond the COVID crisis, which is still keeping us very busy and hopefully will be wrapped up sometime next year. Uh, the next one, the next real challenge and also opportunity is climate change. And that has been around for a long time, of course, but now we're saying, well, if we made sacrifices and we changed how we do things in the COVID crisis, can we do the same when it's about climate change and global warming? The reality is that uh, COVID-19 is just a test run for climate change. That is in terms of impact, in terms of uh, urgency, but it's just a little bit slower. So we have a hard time understanding what's coming in 40 years. Or, But rest assured, it will all happen in 10 years to a substantial impact of issues, which I'll talk about shortly, if we don't take action now. Again, like I said earlier, we're at a pivot point, at a fork in the road, where we have to take action or... Uh, result in consequences, for example, as we did in COVID, but we weren't ready, and we weren't ready to make those changes here in Switzerland. We are very lucky that we were, uh, to a large degree, of many other countries like the US and Brazil. Yeah, there's a lot of suffering because of this. And the key question when we think about that future of climate change and global warming, this is a scene from San Francisco just uh, four weeks ago, when there was wildfires all over California, the biggest ones ever. Um, the key question that people keep asking me about the future is this one, you know, what will the future bring? And that is not a good question because the future isn't fixed. It doesn't just happen and made in Silicon Valley or China or wherever you think in, at CERN or wherever. Right? The key question for us is when we think about education and our kids in the future is what future we want. Because we have a choice, right? we can have scenes like this every week all over the world or we can do something. And we can be prepared for artificial intelligence, we can be prepared for uh, the end of fossil fuel and we have to make those choices and we have to think about what kind of skills and education we need. As I was saying earlier, yeah, yesterday, we are in warp drive into the future and here's four things that are happening that are going to require different thinking. First is big tech. Everything is about technology. So technical skills and understanding technology is becoming crucial. We have to teach it our kids, we have to teach it ourselves. And I think this is not about program, it's about understanding what technology does and what the options are. Big health, clearly everything is about healthcare, wellness, well-being, food, that is exploding and trillions of euros are going to shift in that direction in public funding. We have big state, the state is mingling with everything and that's sometimes good, as it is here in Switzerland for the most part, and sometimes not so good, as it is in Brazil and other countries who are more hard hit. Uh, but, of course, most people don't like big states, so this may be a little bit temporary. But here's the biggest one, huh? big green. Because now we're saying, you know what? COVID is, was an emergency, and now the next wave is global change, climate change and global warming and energy and sustainability. That is the big area that we need to focus on, not just because we must focus on it, also because it's a new economy. I think the World Economic Forum has said 395 million new jobs if we invest in nature. Right? An interesting point of view, I think, that we need to look at and say, well, going back to what I said yesterday about Buckminster Fuller, uh, the future is a choice between utopia and oblivion. We can make that choice now. The next 10 years will be that choice, and our kids will have to live with that choice. Uh, and as we're seeing right now, this is essentially a pivoting moment where we look at everything like inequality, right? where we look at uh, economic systems, we look at climate change, and of course COVID and pandemics, right? and we, are turning, we need to turn the world around. We need to act. We need to come up with new rules, norms, social contracts, solidarity, this is a time of reset. 
and the skills we need from us, from our kids, from our employees, from people with us, right? They are about imagination. They're about storytelling, about negotiation. They're all ephemeral skills right? and character traits. Um, Einstein once said imagination is more important than knowledge. I think that's still very much about knowledge, <laughs> but, anyway, but imagination is what we need to create that future. Um, and on that note, I think really what's happening is it's we're totally clear right now is that sustainability is no longer about just a nice to have or afterthought after we have dinner, uh, steak dinner. Uh, it's, it's not an ideology, it's not altruism, it's the business plan for humanity. It is the way that we're going to go forward in the future and say, well, this is how we can survive and prosper. And this is what's happening right now. So education in that area is going to be crucial. If you're looking at just the numbers, of course, this does not make for a very good dinner conversation, whether it's the anomalies or CO2 emissions or the climate map of the future with 300 million climate refugees coming to Europe including Switzerland. Right? So it's something that we must act on. I think it's totally clear we are in a future where that is becoming crucial for us to understand the circular economy. Again, been much talked about for a long time, but I think in 2030, the only economy there is will be a circular economy. That is the only thing that we're going to have because that's the only thing that will be useful for us without destroying what we like. Right? And the unthinkable will become the new normal, including carbon tax on airplanes, carbon tax on meats, uh, carbon tax on, of course, taking a regular car, uh, and feeding that back in the system, cutting out the fossil fuel subsidies. That's all on the agenda. And what do we have to learn for this? Well, we have to learn a lot of negotiation, a, l a lot of uh, interpersonal skills, a lot of emotional intelligence, a lot of things that, that are coming together. So we're going through this window in this future. I mean, we're clearly going into a new time, and thus we need a new agenda for education. Yes, science, technology, of course, we have to understand, but in the end, right, these are human-only skills. Intuition, foresight, creativity, design, understanding, uh, communication, development. Uh, these are all things that computers can maybe simulate eventually, but the hacky skills, uh, the ethics, creativity, those are skills that we're going to see as human-only skills. And as Klaus Schwab keeps saying, you know, th this time right now, the pandemic creates a rare and narrow opportunity to reimagine what we want from the world and to reimagine re education. <laughs> uh, again, what world will we live, leave to our kids and how they're going to be equipped to deal with this world? Because yeah, in 10 years, 9 billion people on the internet uh, half of the jobs will be virtual or in the cloud. Uh, so clearly, this is a key development that's happening. I think we're moving away from the fossil fuel economy. That's roughly, uh, I think, 10 million people work in the fossil fuel economy. Now we're moving to, away from that into the renewable uh, fuel economy. And I think this is really quite a huge shift in every possible way. I call this the people planet purpose prosperity economy or the green economy, the sustainable economy. And that is a huge opportunity, especially for Switzerland, especially for international organizations, because it's a business model that is sustainable and that should lead to a uh, good scenario in the future. And many, many new jobs from research to design uh, to everything else in this new food chain, replacing the old food chain of fossil fuel uh, and fossil fuel subsidies. That is going to be a very big deal, especially for those millennials that I'm showing you here, because the share of population uh, is going to increase. All right, and right now we're still sort of around this, the Generation X and the baby boomers, but they're still making a good chunk. But, you know, right now it's already exploding. So roughly around now it's already at 41% or so, but basically the future is going to be owned by the Gen X and the Gen Zs. You know, the kids are now between 12 and 35. That's going to be an entirely different scenario. We have to help them to understand this future because clearly they are going to be the ones in control of business and governments and, as we see around the world, uh, also taken over governments. Um, like, you know, in New Zealand we have, of course, Jacinda Ardern isn't quite a millennial, but, but a lot closer than I am to this. And they're going to have to juggle this. 2030 landscape, big tech, big health, big state. Right? And here's what they really have to juggle, that right, is the big green. That is the most fundamental thing that we need to look at. And this is, again, 
It's not just because we have to, but because we have an opportunity there to do a reset in the next 10 years. After that, I think uh, we will get to the place where we wish we would have done a reset. <laughs> so, global paradigm shift all over the place. That's what we can expect in the next 10 years. Decisive action on climate change. It will be painful, it will hurt, but it will also create lots of new work. It will shift the money from oil and gas and weapons and whatever we are currently are investing in. Uh, not Aramco, but Griamco, so to speak. Right? Decisive action on climate change that is coming. A renewed focus on healthcare and social and education. Also many, many new jobs in alternative medicine, personalized, customized medicine, and education, of course, as the key component of dealing with that new future challenge. Um, a rise of diverse young and female leaders, and we have already seen that the, the female leaders of the world have fared much better in the COVID crisis. Uh, Taiwan, New Zealand, Switzerland, uh, Sweden, uh, Iceland, and of course Germany. And we're going to see a lot more of that and we will see populism die because the performance has been absolutely miserable as evidenced in the US. But more technology everywhere, right? and basically technology is going to run everything because it's becoming smart and, and cheap and powerful, but we're also going to see more tech lash. You know, people are going to say, well, you know, we want technology to be controlled. So look for technology regulation in the next couple of years. We may see less globalization because of the supply chain issues that every company is looking at, but we're going to see also more global collaboration because only with multilateralism can we actually solve the large problems like security, safety, water, food, disease, and so on. Right? So, in a nutshell, this is where we're going also in the context of, of the green future and the, uh, the green deals that are happening around the world. Skills on two levels, and the STEM levels and the HECI levels, uh, and they're going to be much more on par, as, uh, much more than they have been so far. I think we're going to see a return to humanistic uh, education also at many uh, colleges and schools, in including, of course, uh, art and design and sports and music and ethics and philosophy. Uh, because that is what machines can't do. Right? We're going to do what machines can't do, and we're going to really change the way that we look at this. EQ and IQ, right? In the world's fight against coronas, female leaders show the way. That was from April this year, and it's still true. Let me give you a short quote from my favorite uh, person, the quote from uh, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand. If I could distill it down into one concept that we are pursuing in New Zealand, it is simple and it is this, kindness. Yeah, I imagine as a principle of government, kindness. Well, that sounds like EQ, doesn't it? I think we're going to need a lot more of that. And how do we create this? Well, we have to create the environment for it. We have to create the openness for it, the possibility for it. So that wraps up the second take on uh, the green future and education. Going a little bit closer tomorrow, I'll go on a little bit longer uh, on uh, the remaining topics of artificial intelligence, the future of work, and other such minor topics. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and I hope you're having a good time at the event, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonard, for this inspiration and for the food for thoughts, which will certainly accompany us in the talks and in the next situations happening here in our future talk. Ladies and gentlemen, find out more about our speakers, about our panelists and experts on our futuretalk.org website or also in our event app. And don't forget to share your thoughts, your comments, your statements by using the hashtag futuretalk20. Now, take a breath. We're back in some moments and maybe think about the thoughts of future talk we shared in the last minutes. See you back at two.
Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to Future Talk 2020. Let's go on with the next point on our agenda. I'm very honored to welcome our next guest, who is joining us via Zoom call. It's Mr. Avi Khan from Hilti. Hilti, a global leader providing innovative tools, technology, software, and services to the commercial construction industry. And the gentleman we will now meet is territory sales representative. And today he serves as a member of Hilti's executive board. And he is joining us via Zoom. Hello, Avi Khan. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Where are you located at the moment? Well, for me, it's actually good morning because I'm located in Dallas in the USA. Okay, then grab a coffee and let's talk about green <laughs> education. I hope you had sure. breakfast already. <laughs> yes, thank you. Mr. Khan, let's start uh, with the first question I'd like directly uh, to hand over to you. How does Hilti implement the UN sustainability goals as a company? Yeah, of course, uh, for Hilti, we are an almost 80-year-old company. Sustainability is an important part of what we do. It's first and foremost embedded in our mission statement because we talk about passionately creating enthusiastic customers and building a better future. And building a better future talks a lot about our involvement in the community and our commitment to sustainability. In the global EcoValley sustainability rating, we're already in the top 13% of companies, but we want to continuously push that forward. And next year, we will communicate for the first time a sustainability report to share also with the public how we bring the sustainability goals to life and how we measure them. Mm -hmm. How do you think is Silti seen from an employer's and customer's perspective when it comes to this important thing to environmental issues? Yeah, we know that for our employees, it's very important uh, to know what the company that they work for does and what type of footprint does it leave on the environment. We every year do an employee survey uh, to check the satisfaction of our people. 80% of our team members respond favorably to the question, uh, does Hilti act in an environmentally conscious and responsible way? So we're happy about that, but also we get many comments. We have 30,000 team members, and in the later survey, we had 19,000 comments, many of them related to the environment, to green education, to green activities, so we know we can and we do plan to do much more. From the customer perspective, we know that it goes in two directions. One, customers want to partner with companies that are acting in a responsible way, and they ask us questions, they wanna know our statistics, they wanna know our reporting, that's at a company level. But we also know that at the product level, Customers want to know the ingredients of a product, the risk of a product. What is the afterlife of that product? Does it get recycled? Does it get reused? So in both perspectives, we have efforts and concentrate our actions. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned the product development. Maybe we can focus on that a bit more. What role does sustainability play in that case? So how uh, is, is a change in the product development? Yes, yeah, sustainability has had a big change on our product development uh, in recent years. First of all, uh, we now take ecological aspects into account already when developing the products. And um, we have tools, we have also chemical products that we sell. So we look at those chemical substances. Are there alternative sources and alternative production materials uh, and technologies that would reduce the impact on the environment or introduce a safer product to produce. We then have to think about the user health and safety of the people using our product. So can we have label free product? Can we have as much as possible products that are safe to use? And is there an opportunity already in product development to think about the second life of that product, the recyclability, the reusability and circuit? circulability of that product. And last but not least, we have more and more customers because we operate in construction that think about aspects of green building. And with that, we try to support them as much as possible with the proper products into those type of projects. Mm -hmm. 
How do you keep your workforce skilled in digitalization? We actually are going through a digital transformation at the moment uh, as a company. And um, we have both internal and external efforts in that area to keep our people skilled. Over the eight decades of history at Hilti, one of our success factors has been the ability to bring people along when we make changes. And we want to do the same now in the digital age. So we invest heavily into skilling existing team members, into equipping them to be successful in the new world. For example, we just launched a new customer relationship management system together with Salesforce, and we have a six month long process where we train every single sales person in the company to use this new digital system and be successful also in the new world. You also mentioned the role of circularity. Um, can you um, dive more into this topic? How does uh, circularity play a role in your company? Um, what projects are going on in that case? Sure. Well, circularity, our belief is now in the forefront and recycling, which was already a good thing, you know, on average, 8.6% of raw material are used out of uh, recycled products worldwide. That's not a bad statistics. I'm proud to share with you that for us at Hilti, it's actually already at 25%. Uh, so we're, we're proud about that and we try to do whatever we can to use recycled materials. But circularity has, of course, many more benefits to the environment where products can be reused again, where products can find a second life. Because we are a direct sales organization, worldwide Hilti works directly with the end user, with the contractor, we have that direct link and we have the ability to collect our products, for example, our tools at the end of our life. We have Uh, usage programs, uh, our fleet management program provides the tools to the customers. They use it for a number of years and then we collect it back. And that allows us then using also our in-house network of repair centers. We have 65 repair centers around the world with 800 of our own technicians to find a second life uh, for those products. So while um, recycling is a great thing, which we do internally and we encourage in all of our projects. We believe circularity will now play a much bigger role. As I said before, we will try to design our products with that in mind and continuously look for opportunities to reuse parts, reuse end products in a second terms to give them a second life. Mm -hmm, great. What does Hilti do for society? Do you have more insights in that case? Sure. As a company, we are strongly committed to that, as I said before, to building a better future. The way we really bring it to life is through the Hilti Foundation. Hilti is a family-owned company by the Hilti family, still today based in Liechtenstein. And what we do is jointly with the family, the company funds the Hilti Foundation that has many projects focused on society. We focus primarily on affordable housing, on economic empowerment for disadvantaged people, and on social change and education through music. We have projects all over the world, sometimes with our customers, sometimes with our team members that really aim to build a better future and to improve the situation in society. A couple of things that are maybe of interest to share as a private sector perspective, even as a private for-profit organization, we give team members around the world, for example, in Germany, in the mm -hmm. USA, days paid to go and do something for society, to go and do something positive for the environment. And we spend tens of millions of dollars on these initiatives with the Hilti Foundation every year because we believe we as a company also need to play a part in building a better future. That's the most important thing, Avi. Great that Absolutely. you're supporting, supporting uh, yeah the world, the people like this. Um, so we're um, on the front door to the new normal, the new era of the new normal. What are the effects um, of the era of the new normal for your business? 
Of course, like all companies, we are not spared uh, from the impact of uh, this new normal. When we realized that times were changing and, and things were happening, we uh, enacted our actions with three priorities in mind. First and foremost, we wanted to keep our team members safe. And we had many efforts in this area and still do until today for distancing, for the way they work, for giving them all the protective equipment that they need. We also wanted to stay close to our customers, and that's perhaps the biggest impact for a company like us. Um, we sell direct, as I said before, we go to job sites, we go to offices around the world, and in many cases, that is only possible by appointment today. In some cases, it's not possible at all. And we use means just like that, Zoom and others, to meet and interact with our customers also digitally. And we are a company that builds an internal culture that meets together, that works together. And we had to shift a lot of those activities to online. What we are finding is many of these activities can happen in a digital way. And because we have invested over so many years to build into a strong culture at Hilti, we are benefit, benefiting from that now. And maybe the last thought I would share Maybe it's relevant for other companies. We made the decision not to make long-term determinations mm -hmm. about policy and about work setup out of a pandemic perspective. So will we all work only from home in the future or mm -hmm. come fully to the old way of working from the office? Probably neither of these extremes, but we don't want to make the decision now. We want to manage this situation where many countries have restrictions on where you can go and how you can gather and give all the flexibility to our people. And when the pandemic is over, really make smart decisions on flexible work arrangements, on work from home, maybe even work from anywhere, the new buzzword, mm. but we will do that when the pandemic is over. Mm. So no long-term, term, more short-term decisions. That makes sense, even if we don't know what's happening tomorrow, next week, next year. Yeah. yeah, we learned we have to be very flexible in these yeah. times and yeah. things change from day to day or week to week. Um, restrictions on travel, for example, yeah. restrictions on the movement of people and goods. And mm -hmm. you have to stay flexible. You, you have to respond. But we believe there is room for more flexibility, for more work from home. We know that our team members in many cases appreciated that. They appreciated the additional flexibility and the work-life balance. But equally, we have people that are very eager to come back into uh, an office environment. Mm. Maybe they have kids at home. Yeah, Maybe yeah. they miss interacting with their colleagues. So we want to balance that out and, and then make those decisions. That we hopefully can decide what we want on our own. Uh, but this uh, will take some more days, some more weeks or months to go. Um, let's talk about uh, your workforce for greening education. Um, what are your next plans for skilling them up? Yeah, we see a real opportunity in ensuring our team members understand the impact that we as a company, but also them as an individual can have on the environment and how their decisions impact uh, all of us for many, many years to come. Um, a current initiative that we're running that really had to do a lot with education is involving our cars. Because we have thousands of people out seeing customers, we also have thousands of vehicles around the world. And of course, that's no secret, vehicles create a certain negative impact on the environment. What we try to do is educate our people what is the carbon footprint of each and every vehicle and in each of every decision that we make and making sure the environmental aspects of our vehicles are indeed part of that decision, what will be our car fleet of the future. Of course, we need to take it in balance with the infrastructure that's available in a country. In some countries, using electrical vehicles is really a viable option because the charging stations are there, then the infrastructure is there. In some countries, it should be natural gas. In some countries, other solutions. So it's just one example what we find when we give our people the tools and the knowledge to take a decision that takes a holistic view. Yes, of course, the economic aspects of that decision, 
we, we need to be mindful of that, but really understanding the opportunity that they have to have a positive impact on the environment, our people respond in such a positive way. So also in the private sector, there is an opportunity to improve the education and the awareness of people in a way that informs their decisions. Hmm. What do you think are the skills the new generation needs uh, from your point of view? Well, I would answer a question in two ways. When it comes specifically to green education, I see in our, the new generation joining our workforce, I see a lot of passion. I see a lot of knowledge. They are self-educating in this area. And that's why I believe many of them join Hilti because they want to work for a company where they can identify with our purpose and with our statement and really be a part of building a better future. Uh, they are well educated. They are, of course, very digital savvy. The new workforce, they're very mobile. So for a company like us, that's very attractive. We need to make sure all of our people and especially all of our leaders are aware of not only our sustainability efforts, but the impact we expect to have. And mm -hmm. then the most critical thing is that then when they make decisions on a new manufacturing plant, on a new product, that the environment is an important aspect that they take. And then the second way I would answer your question is something that is probably obvious to all of us, but we invest heavily into that, and that's the success of our people in the digital age. We have an average tenure of more than 12 years at Tilti. So even though we have grown and added many people, we have people that have been with us for years and decades. Mm. And we believe in diversity, also generational diversity. And we want to make sure all generations in our workforce can be successful. And we invest heavily into the skills that they need to also be successful in the digital age. You have a huge responsibility at Hilti as a member um, of the board. Um, so putting profitability in relation to sustainability goals, how do you view this for the future? Yeah, we really want to find ways where the two are not in competition. For example, in the example I just gave with the vehicles, for example, we are finding solutions that are better for the environment, but are also economically better for us because we will save on our fuel costs, we will save on our maintenance costs. In manufacturing, we find that in some cases using uh, environmentally friendly technologies like solar, for example, in the long run, will actually save us money. So the first and foremost thing we want to do is make sure as much as possible, there's not a conflict between the two. Because we are a decentralized company and we empower our leaders to make decisions, we want to reflect in the future whenever they create an impact on the environment, whenever an activity that they do creates a pollution, for example, that that is actually reflected in their result with a cost. And then they can make a decision whether that's the decision they want to make or not. Already today, we do our reporting according to the GRI initiative, and we want to enhance that and also allow our local business leaders in each country, in each unit, to make those trade-off decisions between economical decisions and the environment and bring that economic foot, the, uh, footprint that they make on the environment also into their economic decision-making. One last question, Avi. Um, we had a futurist, I don't know if you heard him the last uh, minutes, and um, he said, COVID is a test run for climate change. What a statement. Um, what are your thoughts about this sentence? I think it's a, it's a strong statement, but I think what is for sure valid for all of us, we have to act. That's how we feel as a company. We operate in more than 100 countries, and of course, the regulations and the interpretation of climate change and what it means in that country is very different. That is why we decided we don't want to wait for government regulations, but we want to take the responsibility of our, on our own to do our part, to avoid that climate change is leading to COVID-like impacts on us in the future. 
I'm not a futurist. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know that if we act today as individuals, as companies, and as a society, we do have an opportunity to reduce the impacts of climate change. And that is what is motivating us at Hilti to take action in this area. What a perfect ending of this very interesting talk. Avi Khan, member of the executive board at Hilti Group, thank you very much for your thoughts, for sharing your thoughts with us, with our audience, and, and for yeah, taking time, being part of Future Talk 2020. Yeah, All the thank best you for to you. Thank you. Bye bye, Avi Khan. Bye. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, let's now go on with today's first panel. I'm looking forward to uh, meeting the four um, people uh, that will talk um, with me about the next panel. How does the new normal impact greening education? How can we set up vocational education or TVET for greening our economies? How do we achieve a more inclusive ecosystem? We will talk about this topic and I'd like to introduce my uh, four panelists. One is live here in Bern on site, Mr. Philip Ernie, Director at Center for Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability. Hello and Hello. welcome to nice Future to Talk 2020, Mr. Ernie. And three more specialists join us via Zoom call and here they are. I say hi to Nasreen Mani, Executive Director of the Global Apprenticeship Network. Here she is. Hello, Nasreen. We check the Good microphone. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> there she is. Hello. Also, a warm welcome to Catherine Rowan, Vice President, Human Resources of Nestle. Good Hel afternoon, everybody. Great Hello, to be here Catherine. with you. <laughs> Good to have you here. And Andreas Hart, Managing Director at Lucas Nulle GmbH. Hello. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here. We can hear you, we can see you. I would say let's start with our panel. We have interesting things to discuss. And uh, maybe we start with Nathri Many. One question I'd like to hand over to you. You're the Executive Director of Global Apprenticeship Network again and a specialist in the field of skills development. You also have a strong partnerships with the private sector. So could you tell us how can the private sector lead the way in developing strategies for greener vocational education programs, also particularly in light of the impact of COVID-19? Absolutely, and thank you for that question. Um, it's a privilege to be able to share our work and um, it's quite an honor to share the stage with Catherine Rowan, who is one of our key partners at Nestle. And I think that's the heart of the GAN's work and the, the heart of the response to your question is about collaboration and partnership. It's critical that when we're talking about a future of work um, that includes greening uh, economies, including greening the workforce, that the private sector is closely involved with the development of curricula, with the design of the education system. Um, it's critical that we understand the issues of supply and demand and that we're able to tailor the education system to the needs of the labor market, understanding the innovations and technologies. Um, and I think it was very exciting. The previous speaker from Hilti highlighted some interesting things that are happening in his organization. But it's also essential that we take messages like that to our education system, to our labor market practitioners, for them to understand what developing these technical skills means, what these vocational skills will be. Um, I think it's critically important that we are able to work together to address the issues of jobs and skills mismatch. Um, you, we've picked up as the GAN that, you know, one of the issues that constantly crops up, and it doesn't matter where we operate, and GAN operates in at least 16 countries around the world, developed and developing. But this issue of jobs and skills mismatch comes up time and time again. And what that means is the education system has curricula, has education frameworks in place, but they're not really aligned to the needs of the labor market, not really aligned to the developments taking place in business. So we're talking about more agile and flexible systems. We're talking about developing skills bases for people that they can move through the system, they can move through economies, they can shift jobs 
as the technologies influence their day-to-day -day work. So I think it's really exciting to see that these conversations are happening, such as today, but equally important we've seen with the last eight months or 10 months of COVID um, is how rapidly education systems, governments, policymakers, and the private sector have come together to adapt, mm -hmm. to put in place different learning systems, to put in place digital learning, offline learning, remote learning assistance mechanisms. And I think for me, one of the silver linings, if there is a silver lining out of COVID, is that policymakers have become really responsive very quickly, that we're engaging in far more social dialogue and we're talking to one another as equal partners. Um, and I think we're looking at really shifting what has been very traditional education systems to respond to this future of work that has suddenly arrived far faster than we imagined. So thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Nazreen, for sharing these uh, thoughts with us. Catherine Rowan, uh, you're the Vice President of Human Resources at Nestlé, and uh, Nestlé is the world's largest food and beverage company headquartered here in Switzerland, and you employ about 300,000 people around the globe. So could you tell us from your perspective, what skills will the next generation of management need to embrace the sustainability priorities of large companies like Nestlé uh, as you seek to ramp up your positive impact on society? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. It's an excellent question. And, and I would say I would slightly turn the question around to instead of the skills for, uh, for the next generation, it's really the skills of today's generation, mm -hmm. because I think the, the future is now when it comes to sustainability and the future, mm -hmm. we really need to be acting Uh, today in order to make a difference for tomorrow. And in fact, as a company, we've made a number of, uh, of, of statements and we have very, very high ambition to, to make a difference uh, in this world with respect to topics like um, um, our emissions, uh, plastics, for instance. We have said that by 2025, we would have 100% of our packaging and reusable packaging or recyclable packaging, and, and that's literally tomorrow. Uh, and similarly, uh, when it comes to um, uh, to our emissions uh, and our environmental impact, we have said that we'd like to have zero environmental impact in our operations, meaning our facilities and our factories. And even today, we already have some, some factories that have zero uh, water Uh, usage impact because we extract the water from from dairy and uh, not from the environment around us mm -hmm. and we're able to uh, to have limited impact but to your question I would say specifically uh, there are so many that are required in terms of skills for the future and I would say um, three pop up to mind most specifically uh, one is consumer cent centricity and you know it's always been important for you know uh, an industry such as ours and for many industries to be consumer centric But I would say even more so today, it's really important that we're in touch with consumer needs, with consumer preferences, anticipating as well consumer preferences, um, and, and increasingly important to be able to do that and, and to understand the externalities and the external factors that are, that are ongoing because of climate change. The, the second point is, uh, or skill that I would say is important is around communication and stakeholder management. Uh, and, it, you know, it seems... Uh, obvious. I mean, those of us who deal with the external world and uh, over uh, the course of our career understand that, and people like Nazreen have to do that each and every day. Um, but I, I have to say that it's even more important now that, that our managers are able to interact externally, not just focus on, on the on the day to day, but be able to really engage with uh, NGOs, with government, with startups, with universities, etc. I'll give you an example of. Um, Uh, one of our one of our markets in Ecuador, uh, in the work that they've done, they reached out to young people uh, with a, a project called uh, Areto Planeta, mm -hmm. uh, in order to be able to help the country meet its its plastic uh, neutrality objective. And so, reaching out to young people to get ideas from them to then incorporate into the business is, is critically important. So. You know, it's not everybody who can who can make that happen, and uh, and and having the skills to make it happen is really important. And the final thing that I think is is critical uh, as a skill is having more of a big picture mentality. So, for example, 
um, it's taking a holistic approach and it's not necessarily looking at it from, you know, as they teach you in business school to, you know, look at the bottom line and uh, whether or not you're making a profit or a loss, but it's really having a, a holistic view as to how um, how the, the the products, the services that one offers are able to make a difference in society. And really that that is going to help us uh, make a difference in this in this world so in order to be able to drive innovation and do it in a sustainable way. So those are my thoughts on that topic. Thanks for sharing them with us, Kathleen. I have more questions uh, also that I'd like to hand over to you. But uh, one more question to Mr. Philip Erni. You're the Director Center for Corporate Responsibility and Sustainability at the University of Zurich. Um, um, to what extent does the normative concept, Education for Sustainable Development, ESD, uh, encourage students to challenge established arguments and marketing slogans by doing their own uh, empirical research? Yes, uh, you mentioned education for sustainable development, the concept developed by UNESCO. Mm -hmm. And when you look a little bit, a little bit at this um, definition or the explanations, it's meant to develop knowledge, skills, values and worldviews to enable people to become more sustainable. Mm -hmm. But for me, there is something missing. What is, for example, the role of entrepreneurship and innovation for sustainable change? And there is, in fact, a UN resolution 69-2010 in, passed in 2014 uh, on entrepreneurship for sustainable development. There are the UN sustainable development goals that see business more as part of the solution and not just part of the problem. And this uh, is not really addressed. And as you mentioned, I'm uh, the director of an associated institute, which is meant to be a bridge between academia and the private sector. And what I learn on a daily basis is that there's so much knowledge around in the private sector, so many innovative solutions. And this knowledge also needs to come to the university. It's, we still have this belief that there is a one-way street, the university does research, creates knowledge, and then the private sector adopts it. No, there is a lot of knowledge created in the private sector that should also come back to the university. And I realize that it's not just it's not just a problem at university that they're that they're often detached from this reality, but even at high schools. I mean, we had research projects at high schools on sustainable development, education, and I realized it's mostly normative in the sense that uh, students are told what are the global sustainability problems, mm. who is the perpetrator or the, who is to blame for it, how can we regulate these. Uh, evil actors and often there is an implicit anti-business rhetoric in it mm -hmm. and they often show documentaries and then you see clearly okay there is a bad business polluting the river here and there's a good NGO that is uh, protesting and then eventually there's regulation and the, the bad um, business actor is tamed mm -hmm. and so on so it's all about regulation it's about uh, change as a potential risk rather than a potential opportunity and governments also see mostly their role as regulators, not facilitators okay. of change. If they would see their role as facilitators of change, they would ask the question, so what are the products and services that would create great value for sustainable change, but they're not developed in the private sector? So the government could say, okay, let's create incentives that the private sector starts to invest in such mm. products or technologies. That can be through competition, through advanced purchasing agreements, through faster regulatory approvals, and so on. And that would really then be really an engine of sustainable change. But to go back to the university uh, to, or to high schools, there's often the question, what can you do mm. to, be, to make the world more sustainable? And then it's all about lifestyles or go and protest against the, the, the evil actors. But I think the UN Sustainable Development Goals are not about activism, they're about action. Mm -hmm. And it's, about, it's not about personal lifestyles and feeling good about yourself. It's about scalable, sustainable solutions. So wherever you look, you need business, you need entrepreneurship and innovation for sustainable change. And that's the aspect that is missing and that makes students often quite uncritical. They adopt the rhetoric, they hear everywhere, and uh, it doesn't encourage them to really critically think, do we really have the right baseline assumptions here? And the UN Sustainable Development Goals, they represent a paradigm shift in thinking, but it hasn't really arrived in politics or at universities. That's a little bit mm. my concern. Okay. A lot to do yeah. in, the, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Ernie. Um, Andreas Hart, 
You are the director at Lukas Nülle, a global player for technical education in Germany. And my question is, how can TVET help make the transition to green technologies um, for the wider community? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for that important question. Uh, we are not only actively working in uh, Germany, but we do uh, more in, let's say, more than 120 countries worldwide. And from that perspective, um, TVET, so a transfer of a full set of, let's say, latest green technology from Germany, from European countries we are dealing with, um, to wider communications is an excellent educational purpose vehicle. Uh, we see this vehicle is going to strengthen local countries on their way to a much higher industrialization level. And for that reason, uh, also avoiding the mistakes we did here in Europe, uh, let's say of the older industrialized brothers. And uh, for that specific uh, purpose, technical competencies are the basic tool to make it happen for those countries. And uh, let's come to a real best practice approach. As a starting point, together with the Ministry of Education, Industry and Energy, in many of those countries, good ones or the, the developing ones already on industrial level, uh, we do provide workforce qualification. For example, we start with a stable energy management of a local community or a province of a local state via first microcrits, later at a larger scale with a more intelligent smart crit. And therefore, an updated curriculum for all technical careers on um, professional in professional institutes on university level, and a real investment in digital green uh, training hubs will build a sound foundation for such a development. So our recommendation is always, uh, with a good funding in the background, from uh, World Bank, from KFW, from Germany, from. Uh, uh, African Development Bank from uh, Agence Française de Développement, for example, uh, ADB or JICA, start with some pilot institutes and do a vocational rollout on country level or on province level during the first two years. This is a real hands-on approach where we would like to support, let's say, those countries. A good starter, and that's something we found out ourselves here in Germany as a company, is always solar power. Mm -hmm means provide the adequate infrastructure first with a zero CO2 footprint mm. in uh, various non-developed developed places. And for that reason, establish your own inclusive uh, ecosystem. And we would be very happy to support people, governments, politicians to make that happen. Great. They heard you. Maybe... They contact you in the next uh, days. Thank you for, uh, for this insight, so. Mr. Hart. <laughs> Catherine Rowan, one more question I'd like to hand over to you. So many changes going on at the moment uh, all around us. What do you think? Do you need more younger change makers on board at um, Nestlé to help your company meet rapidly evolving societal expectations? I would say absolutely. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, and hands down, we have certainly been committed to making sure that uh, young people are part of the equation at Nestle. But I would say, first and foremost, we believe that a successful company, that we can only be successful if we have, a, a, if we are uh, a, as diverse uh, inside as, as our consumers are outside. And so, uh, our company really needs to reflect that diversity in the, of the society that uh, that we serve, uh, age and stage, different mindsets, different attitudes, um, and and of course, young people are a big part of the equation. I think we only have to look at our own children. I have twenty-something children uh, who teach me each and every day about uh, new things and how to be a little bit more uh, in tune with the environment and climate change. So I have to say, our, our, uh, both outside the company and inside, we find that our young people are change makers. Uh, but what, what in this context, uh, where climate change is such an important uh, consideration, it really helps us uh, to have people with a different mindset and a different uh, sensibility around the topic. And it, we have for a long time uh, 
pretty much since about uh, almost seven years now, have been actively involved in engaging uh, and supporting uh, young people uh, around the world. It started in Europe in 2013 with what we called our Nestle Needs Youth uh, uh, campaign uh, and initiative. And we expanded that across uh, the globe uh, into 2017 and, and today. And it really is all about making sure that young people have the skills that they need to thrive today and tomorrow. Very much aligned to what Nazreen was saying in terms of making sure it's there, there's, a, you know, she talked about jobs and skills mismatch. And it's one of the reasons why we've been so actively involved in the Global Apprenticeship uh, Network, along with Nazreen and, and many of the organizations involved. Mm. Uh, it, it, the Nestle Needs Youth Initiative really has three different pillars. It's around employability um, and employment, around entrepreneurship, uh, and also agripreneurship. And perhaps I'll just mention one topic and focus a little bit on what we're doing in one, one area around, uh, around agripreneurship in, uh, in Nigeria. And that is that we've, we've just uh, announced a recent agreement with the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And it really is all about making sure that young farmers are, are able to have the skills necessary uh, to improve uh, their, their, their skills, their, their harvesting, their crops, uh, in order to be able to have sustainable lives, sustainable communities. And of course, for Nestle, it's sustainable product at the end of the day. And so it's a win-win, uh, And but it's again, it's making sure that our young people are skilled and that's aligned to our goals around sustainability uh, so that we can create strong communities going forward. Thank you, Catherine. Philip Ernie, your center aims uh, to explore the role of the private sector in sustainable development on the local and global leave. So the question is, do, you, do we need more input from the world of practice in view of the fact that effective solutions to sustainability challenges are created outside the education system? Yeah, that's what we really try to do. I mean, in my teaching courses on sustainability and society, I invite a lot of people from the practical world, mm -hmm. a lot of successful companies that have developed sustainable solutions. And I'm very surprised all of them that um, students are curious, they're interested, they love this knowledge coming in from mm -hmm. outside. Uh, they start also, they, st they ask critical questions, but they also realize that often these businesses can be part of the solution. I, I remember I had one CEO from a uh, some medium-sized company in Switzerland called Monopole AG. They are uh, producing paints, mm -hmm. and they were wondering what's the link between a, a company making paints, build, painting the Apple building in Cupertino, and, and, and sustainable development. Okay. And uh, and he was actually irritating the students quite a bit because he said, "I mean, regulation is killing our business, and so on." And they thought, oh, "Why is he inviting him?" <laughs> and then suddenly he talked about his business in India, okay. where he created. Um, um, he invested there 40 millions in building up the market there, and he developed an innovation, namely it's called the coolest white. It's a paint where you put it outside on the wall of the house, the internal in temperature decreases by three or four percent. So there's suddenly an entire city being built in India with this paint, which there's no need for air conditioning anymore and so on. And so suddenly they realized, oh, maybe he's part, uh, he can also be part of the solution. And there was a critical mm -hmm. question saying, well, you are just outsourcing uh, this work from Switzerland to India because the jobs, uh, the, the, the costs are lower and you're yeah. exploiting people there and, uh, and then and just to make profits and so on. And then he said, first of all, I can keep the jobs here only because I invest there Do as well. Okay. And second of all, I invested there 40 million and until I make a profit, it will take another 10 That's to true. 15 years. Mm. So a lot is at stake, but he explained them, look, businesses are not creating value for society by merely preventing risks. Mm -hmm. They are creating value by deliberately taking risks to build up a new business. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, a core message that also needs to arrive in our education system. Thank you, Mr. Ernie. Nazreen Mani, one uh, next question I'd like to hand over to you. And first, thanks for tuning in um, from South Africa today. Um, how Thank does you. GAN Global <laughs> view the relationship between the future of work, work-based learning, and the green economy? So I think um, we're seeing that there's an absolute intersection between all of these concepts. Um, and when we spoke earlier, I know several speakers have spoken about the SDGs, and I think part of 
the silo mentality that we sometimes get trapped in is that we look at SDG 4 as education, SDG 8 as decent work, and we leave the skilling discussion there. In fact, skills, the skills agenda cuts across all of the SDGs. We need educated and skilled people to drive the sustainable development revolution. And, and to build on what Mr. Ernie said, we need to move from you know, talking to action and action to impact. And, and for the GAN, what we're seeing is that you know, climate disruption, climate change, um, the need for greening the education system cuts across a number of areas within vocational education. And in fact, it's related to the need for labor forces to be skilled appropriately, to be able to respond and take up these green and sustainably orientated jobs that are emerging. But the climate issue also affects migration and de demographic shifts, which has an absolutely direct impact on TVET systems because TVET systems need to be able to respond to issues of supply, so the local skills supply, but they also need to be able to engage in skilling migrating populations. Now, uh, I think the keynote speaker, the futurist speaker earlier, spoke about 300 million climate migrants coming into Europe. How do we ensure that those migrants are actively engaged in the economy and we, we need to ensure that their skills are linked to what our systems need, whether you're in Europe, in Africa, in Asia or in the Americas? Another interesting issue that's influencing the TVET systems um, and linked to the climate issue is a digital disruption. Uh, because you know the digital te technology, industry 4.0, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, whatever we call it, uh, the issues of smart production, big data, you just have to ask Nestle how those are changing um, agro-processing and agricultural production and then getting into Nestle factories or any other manufacturing environment. It's changing the nature of jobs and it's directly impacting the skills demands in the labor market. And we need to ensure that our VET systems are appropriately um, matured very quickly, in fact. And it speaks to the need for management to review systems. It speaks to the need for policymakers to engage and set up these enabling frameworks. It needs a multi-stakeholder approach. And again, Mr. Annie spoke about the role of the private sector, not just to be a passive recipient of this, but actually the private sector is driving a lot of this change. So why not bring the private sector into the discussions around vocational education system revamp and upgrading? Thanks, Nazreen. Andreas, your company is based in Germany and you're helping and setting up technical education projects around the globe, almost everywhere. So from your point of view, what does the future of vocational education look like? Are we looking at a business as usual or are there trends um, that can reach more people and make learning more efficient? Yeah, this is a very... Uh uh, let's say, interesting question when it comes to change. It is yeah. not business as usual anymore. Uh, not at all. Due mm. to the fact that uh, today our planet uh, is a very vulnerable ecosystem on one mm. hand. Climate change, as I said, is an ongoing process. And from uh, the support we are offering to countries and World Didac as a member we are including, uh, we think that there is no excuse for any further delay. Uh, COVID-19 is and uh, will stay for a certain time and an ongoing game changer. And it, on the other hand, it brings additional momentum for distance learning. And uh, vocational education today through internet, uh, for example, online, makes it a lot easier to share content with much more people than just having people in an institute, in a school, in a university due to uh, the fact that interactive learning online and teaching is still feasible to a much larger amount of people. That's going to be helpful wherever you have an internet connection, and that's the bottleneck, people are ready to start, let's say, um, education. The last point in this uh, development, the future of vocational education is therefore even more important than ever before. Uh, as technology is developing faster and faster, the need to onboard, as someone said before, all 
stakeholders, a multi-stakeholder approach to onboard all stakeholders of such a learning process at a larger scale on time is absolutely mandatory. Uh, there's no way out. There is no excuse for any delay for that reason. Regular curriculum update in technical schools uh, guarantees that no one is left behind in latest eco technologies. Yeah? And for that reason, blended learning theory via uh, internet, online, and practical things in schools, hands-on training, developing hands-on competencies is still a very, very important method. And out of that, there is a need for culture to accept and to celebrate, uh, let's say, lifelong learning of all stakeholders. Adults having already a job, going through a job description, qualification, needs up people like that needs update on a, every, on a daily basis for that reason. Last but not least, distance learning and online tools will be critical to increase efficiency. Hmm. And for that reason, we would like from World Direct and from our company side, give further support wherever needed. Thank you, Andreas. And to all our viewers that are watching us online, you can interact with us and with our panelists. So if you have a question, please um, post the question um, under the YouTube in the comment function, or you can send it um, via our um, app, our event app, and it will appear here on my tablet so I can hand the question over to our panelists, to our experts. So. We want interaction with you. Andreas, one more question I'd like to hand over. Um, in your opinion, how can vocational education or apprenticeships have a sustainable, uh, sustainable impact on communities, especially uh, in developing countries? Um, this is something that can be a little bit difficult on one hand because it depends on the people in those countries, not only in developing countries. We are also looking at some sort of let's say, missing expertise in political processes, in grant writing, in all how to make an educational program as a living experience, let's say, to learners. And uh, in order to create value add, let's say, to local vocational schools and institutes, even including companies making use of vocational apprenticeships, um, in most cases, people are looking for how to get started. And uh, for that reason, the first very important agenda point is always implement an environmental ethic. What does that mean? A greening initiative, as well as an implementation of an environmental ethic, means get all members of the local community involved and make it as an application of ethic when you take decisions, uh, economic decisions that affect the community, that you really are following the environmental ethic. That's very important. So we talk in about greening behavior. Greening behavior is going to be enhanced, let's say, through better understanding of uh, latest technology out of industry from first countries, from Europe, from Germany, and also in Asia and other areas. And please give people the skills and the hands-on competencies to improve sustainability and their area start from scratch sometimes, but it's worth doing it. Having said that, yeah, it's not only a promise, we must walk our talk. Future talk is the headline of today's event. We must walk our future talk or our talk of today. We must be aware of the lessons because our actions and let's say behaviors in wherever you are and wherever the country is, wherever the community is, it's going to be seen as a, a lesson to a community of learners with numerous stakeholders, political level, industry level, the normal private person, bring people together, round table discussions, round table measurements. And for that reason, I think greening organizational behavior, we call that, and attitudes are king. That was the first point. Let me just give you another important agenda point for implementing ecological literacy. Mm. What we have found out, every student and every teacher will develop a comprehensive understanding of the basic patterns and processes by which nature sustains life and how these ecological concepts relate to, let's say, sustainable human communities. Greening curriculum, including lessons learned, 
from Europe, from the US, from all the others, from China as well, very industrialized countries, and they're trying and error. Please include this in greening curriculum. And of course, put a high priority on professional development because the trainers, the instructors, the people are in the educational sector are actually the multipliers of all. Train the trainer programs are very substantial and are valuable assets for that. And last but not least, implement the leading principle. We call it learning it by living it. What to do first? We have seen, and we as a company as well, as a vocational institute, will green its facilities and adopt and demonstrate environmental principles. For example, very pragmatic stuff such as the three R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle. That's already a strong action. If everybody does this, we would have already a better world, let's say, mm. on a larger scale. Mm. And then start implementing renewable energies for local power supply, Please invest in energy efficiency to reduce consumption of energy. And of course, look at your electricity bill every month. I mean, there's a very practical things. For that reason, consequently, look that uh, you cons you're going for resource conservation. Make your institute, your community, a direct showcase and real industrial application to a certain extent of the future professions you're dealing with. Because this will allow, um, on a social level, for an experiential place as pedagogy teaching approach and will also enhance, let's say, the environmental awareness of students and staff. They will see their vocational school utilizing green practices on a day-to-day -day basis. That's something very fundamental. You can feel it. You are within your passion, your heart. Younger people and older people, let's stay together. And the learning outcome will be very impressive for that reason. Greening facilities and operations are the right method. Thank you, Andreas. Mr. Ernie, the potential for public-private partnerships as a driving force for sustainable change is immense. And can you share with us some initiatives of CCRS which have successfully fostered collaborations working towards a green economy and ecosystem? Well. Um we are not really the, the ones who are um, facilitating these things. We are more li mostly collecting good examples of how things can actually work. And I, before I was director of, the, of this institute, I worked for FAO in Rome, and it was a project on the sustainable provision of environmental services in agriculture in tropical countries. And I, uh, uh, I observed many interesting projects in Kenya where um, um, markets for environmental goods were created for local people. And um, what does that mean? For example, you have this classical concept of payments for environmental services. It's argued that's a nice business case. You have upstream farmers that adopt sustainable practices, so the water quality will improve downstream, so the industry downstream should pay these farmers for being providers of environmental services. But the problem here is that all the, if there's a third party, often WWF or CARE or another donor agency, they organize everything. They provide farmers with tree seedlings for agroforestry. They do the grass strips for soil erosion. Um, they make sure that the industry downstream pays because they want to have the logo of WWF or whatever. But it's not really a business case because the main problem in Kenya when it comes to sustainability is poverty. So these farmers, they adopt unsustainable, they're forced to sometimes adopt unsustainable practices because of poverty, because of lack of access to mm -hmm. knowledge, lack of access to investment. And, uh, and so they, when, when you look at the average farm size in this upstream region was 0.3 hectares. They have mostly six to, f to seven kids, and often they survive on such a tiny plot because one kid has a, uh, obtained a job in the, mm -hmm. in the ne nearby city. But if the others don't get a job outside agriculture, if they have to stay on this small plot, they cannot um, um, provide their own food. I mean, it's too small for, uh, for inheriting this tiny plot, so they have to migrate or cut wood uh, to uh, cultivate further land, and that's not even allowed in, in Kenya. So we often don't see the real problems there. And we often take markets away from the local people. For example, why cannot farmers grow these tree seedlings and make a business out of it? Why can you not 
uh, encourage farmers to become entrepreneurs and specialize on services to do soil conservation measures for other farmers and then get a payment for it. So there are many possibilities mm -hmm. to really make the local people part of the solution. And what my experience always was, was the best solutions come from the local people. They don't come from us. Really? And it's so tough for us mm -hmm. to accept this. Mm -hmm. But I think it's time to take the local people who know the local context better, who, who know the local needs better, to take them more seriously and invest in these people so they can also become part of the solution. They're not just part of the problem. It's also an issue. Thank you, Mr. Ernie. Mrs. Manny, what are some of the mechanisms that GAN Global regards as a, a critical to promote sustainable and inclusive solutions in this place in order to move beyond policy and into implementation? Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> One click, yeah, we, we said there you the, are. That's Thank the you. phrase for 2020, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, <laughs> so. So that, that's really key for the work of GAN Global and our partners. It's, it's about shifting the discussion. And some of the strategies um, revolve around the policy angle, but, but it's really important to get this enabling framework right. Uh, but then also building on peer-to-peer -peer learning. So getting our members to share with one another, getting our partners to learn and, and build on good practice. Um, also building on CEO and private sector leadership. I think, uh, you know, one of our speakers at the beginning, I think it might have been Mr. Ernie, spoke about using the private sector and leveraging from the lessons that the private sector has in place um, and taking that best practice and shifting strategies. Uh, but also CEO leadership is key. We know that our CEOs engage with one another, but they also engage with government leaders, they engage with policy makers, um, so it's really important to get that uh, work going. And then the, the third angle is, is getting our hands dirty. So going into countries, learning from the different contexts within which we work, adapting program delivery to the needs of the different country contexts. Um, and here, what's also important, I think, is strategies around very focused professional development. So building a pool of competent trainers and lecturers within the VET system, ensuring that we create these enabling learning environments. Uh, we have the adequate funding in place. So along with this policy landscape, the legislative framework, you also need the funding to support such work, um, ensuring that your standards and your curriculum design are in place and are relevant um, and responsive. Um, you know, I've worked in countries where the need to sh change curriculum quickly can't happen simply because uh, the process is so bureaucratic. So how do we change those attitudes? Um, and then again, you know, ensuring this, this social dialogue. Um, so I spoke about the need for multi-stakeholder partnerships. Uh, within that, ensuring that all of the stakeholders have clear roles and responsibilities. Uh, but ensuring also that the social dialogue is inclusive. So it cuts across all of the users of the system, as well as those who are responsible for designing the system. Uh, the other issue is having sound labor market data. Uh, we need statistics. We need to understand what is happening in the system. We need to see um, the data to, to enable us to project and to be able to plan ahead, uh, because that's what's important in, in VET systems, in skills development systems. Um, and then also this robust regulatory framework that creates this enabling environment. Um, and I think, you know, if, if all of these elements can come together, uh, we can build a framework of quality work-based learning, quality vocational education. Um, you have the elements of entrepreneurship and business management built into that. And, and we really then can speak about an adaptable and responsive workforce uh, that has been given the tools to be able to meaningfully engage with the labor market, with the green economy, and can contribute to sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you, Nazreen, and also thank you to our viewers. I just received some good questions here um, through our um, event app. That's why I have my mobile here. Don't wonder, I'm not chatting. <laughs> I got questions here. I'd like to hand over them. Um, after one question, I'd like to um, 
hand over to Mrs. Rowan, to Catherine, one more question about the coronavirus situation. Has this situation resulted in a renewed focus um, on reducing your company's environmental impact? Yeah, absolutely. I would yeah. say, um, I think it's reminded all of us of the intrinsic link between our own health and uh, and the health of the uh, of the planet. Uh, there's no question, uh, there's no doubt about that. And if anything, the pandemic has uh, accelerated the work that was already underway within our within our organization. We are already seized by the need to make change. But I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. For instance, if we think about you know, uh, our food offering, we've now sort of moved more towards uh, plant-based foods uh, and alternatives uh, because our consumers are looking for that. So you know, Sweet Earth or, or Nature's Heart products in the United States or, or here a Garden Gourmet Burger, uh, many of you have probably already tasted it here in Europe. There's a great examples of, uh, of how we've tried to transform our, our product line in order to be able to meet consumer needs and also then have a, a, a reduced impact on the environment. Um, we've also just recently, uh, and this is literally hot off the press, we've just joined the Cool Food Pledge. And uh, that's along with restaurateurs, other companies. Um, it, it's a, it's a it workplaces and cities. It's a growing movement to reduce uh, the impact of greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2030. But in, it's all about uh, the meals served on our premises. So we we estimate with our 300,000 employees, we probably serve about uh, every single uh, you know uh, year 50 million 50 million uh, meals. It, that's a lot of meals. And so this is all part of uh, ensuring that we do this in the most sustainable way. So we've committed to make that happen across the uh, our, our entire network. And then the final one, and it's my personal favorite, is uh, our pledge to to plant three million trees. And it literally it was announced in March. So right in, at the beginning of the at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, those will be planted, and already, already some have been planted in Brazil uh, and in Mexico as early as last spring. Uh, and so really taking a look at reducing uh, the impact and making sure we have a much cleaner environment moving forward. So it's really exciting stuff, and I, I, I could keep going on, but in the interest of time, I won't. But yes, indeed, it certainly accelerated the work that we've been doing on the environment. Great, thanks uh, for this very important action of Nestle. I'd like to hand over the one question I just received um, through our app. How should the government and educational institutions entice the private sector to participate or invest in the upskilling of the potential labor force? I hand the question over to all of you who wants to share his thoughts concerning this question. Mr. Ernie, for example, yeah? One example that comes to my mind is uh, the revolution of M-Pesa in Kenya, the, the mobile phone payments mm -hmm. revolution that happened already 15 years ago. How was it possible to create this entire new market? How was it possible to use mobile phones as a tool of empowerment that benefits so many people, millions of people? And that had the start was with sort of um, innovative um, thinkers of development, they wanted to find out, can this be used for poor people, for tra financial transactions? And, but they didn't get any investment. And then they were eventually able to convince DFI, the department, uh, the UK Department of, for Devel International Development, to start a pilot project. Mm. Because that's, companies don't invest if the risk is too big. So mm. that's where governments can chip in and say, OK, we reduce the risk by testing is there actually a market or is there no market? So they conducted this pilot project and some outcomes were unexpected, but then they realized, oh, maybe the market is here, not here. And then suddenly Vodafone came, big companies started to invest in creating the whole infrastructure. And now it has become an industry on its own with its own skills that have to be developed and it helped, it uh, made many parts of the Kenyan economy more sustainable. And they have now their own Silicon Savannah uh, it has become a key industry in, in Kenya that is evolving rapidly. And so that's a good, a good example where the private sector can actually come in, where the public sector is too, considers it to be too risky, and then help to reduce the risk and then trigger the investments that make everything scalable. 
Mm. But it's too much, uh, you expect too much from the private sector if you think they will come up with disruptive technologies just on their own. I mean, it, it, it's simply too uncertain. So that's where you need a government as well. Thank you. Mr. Hart, do you also want to add something? Your point of view, what should the government and educational institutions do? Yeah, it's uh, some of the common uh, challenges we are facing, actually, how to get uh, local industry involved. When you look at a certain area, certain province um, where you have already existing investors, they do produce, uh, they want to produce more. So even foreign investors would like to come in into that area. The big bottleneck is always how can we get qualified workforce there? Otherwise, I do not invest. Um, for that reason, we do support local chamber of commerces here from Germany, looking for investors from Germany in African countries and things like that is always the same problem. The good thing is uh, no one from industry refused to give answers to questions we were asking to them together with uh, educational organizations and institutes and the government, the local government. We brought people together, roundtable discussions, and the demand for today's investors and future new investors was actually fixed, well-defined. So everybody had to understand what the deliverables for uh, workforce qualification was. This is just on paper. When it comes to reality, you need good funds from the governmental side, let's say 60%, 70% of uh, an investment in trainers and in instructors in a center of excellences for specific technical careers you need for the local investors and the new ones. And then the other 30 or 40 percent coming out of the existing uh, companies and the future investors bringing in as some sort of contribution to that new combined efforts, let's say some sort of a uh, value add to create a, a more valuable industrial environment. That's not easy because in many cases, industry expects always that government and educational institutes are actually feeding uh, their demands, uh, let's say, with the appropriate qualification. But this is not going to happen automatically. You always have to bring right people together. This is a part where data can help. We as a company with expertise, we can help. What we also have seen, there's a lot of consultants out there. They even know how to improve that situation and are closely linked to all those stakeholders in such a process. And we have to cooperate more through partnerships, multiple stakeholder partnerships. I heard that some minutes ago. This is actually key to develop those things further. Thank you. Nazreen, is there something you wanted to add? We see your hand. If, if there's time. Yeah, I, sure, I, please. I, we have 10 minutes to go. Thank you, Nazreen. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, the UK apprenticeship model is a really interesting case of how business and government can work together. Um, and, you know, the, the UK has a skills levy system on companies with a payroll of three million pounds and above. Um, and what companies have done is really meaningfully engage with that system. So it's not just young people now doing apprenticeships. In fact, the biggest cohort of apprenticeships, apprentices in the UK at the moment are those people who have been employed for many years. So you're looking in the age group 26 plus. So it's people looking to build existing skills. It's people looking to develop new skills. And that's funded through the government in partnership with employers who contribute to the levy. But also what's interesting is for companies with employees of less, less than 50 people, the British government will actually fund you to take on apprentices. And I think that's an interesting model because it's trying to drive skilling at that SME level, which is often missing. Um, so I think there's some really good practice out there that we can build on. I think there is a criticism in many countries that the private sector simply wants incentives, but I think incentives don't hurt. Um, it's a way to engage with business, um, governments who have really directed and focused skilling policies can make funding available, um, which is a key. But I think what's also important to get this partnership going is to ensure that business is part of the curriculum development and design process. They're part 
of the program development process so that they feel engaged and that they can see the outcome of the system and that it meets the needs of their companies. So, so some examples that could be taken forward. Thank you. Thanks, Nesrin. Catherine, for sure. And just maybe just to add and compliment when, and, and not to repeat what everybody else has said, which I'm, I'm fully aligned with. Um, I would say that one of the one of the things we underestimate for you know a company sitting here in Switzerland and and uh, Andreas you in Germany, uh, uh, you know we we underestimate just how powerful uh, the the apprenticeship program and the frame policy framework has been here in Switzerland and in Germany and what. What we have tried to do is to export the knowledge and the learning from, uh, you know, from this part of the world to other parts of the world, because I think if we can, I think if it, what's lacking in a sense is the policy framework around which um, apprenticeships can can flourish in other jurisdictions, and in some places they're really starting from scratch and there is nothing. And so I think we could do the world a service by talking a little bit more loudly about what's being done uh, in this part of the world and and uh, and exporting uh, some of the success stories uh, in order to be able to uh, to create better frameworks elsewhere. Thanks, Catherine. We. We, we received one question for you, Catherine, uh, th um, through our Hoover app. Um, can you give us an example how you train or educate greening skills, or let's say greening attitudes, within your workforce around the globe? It's a great question, and it's done in multiple ways. So it depends where you're sitting. If you have an office job like I do, uh, it's probably through an e-learning program where you know I sit here in front of my computer as I am doing now, and I can I can learn a lot about our environmental practices and then what role I can play. Um, but what probably the the most important is is uh, on the job, uh, and it really is on the job training around trying to make sure that I, that I talked about a little but about the, uh, the work that we're doing at our factory level to make sure that we have zero, zero emissions, zero waste coming from our facilities. And it really is helping our people learn in the, in the moment how they can play a role in, the, uh, in, in, in ensuring that we have reduced, uh, reduced emissions, for example. Uh, but it's also creating, it, it, it's also about creating a culture of, uh, of innovation. And so we've been really focusing in the last few years on, on getting grassroots ideas um, uh, from our, from all parts of the organization, to in terms of how 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 to meet the challenge of uh, of greening, how do we ensure that we uh, can better meet consumer needs? How can we be a better company? And so. Uh, we've done that through uh, through competitions. We've done that through innovation uh, funds. So it, all of that is part of, and I would say, for the most part, on the on the job learning, on the job training, uh, and, uh, and and that has been the most powerful uh, way in which we've been able to accomplish our our objective. Thanks, Catherine. So we're coming to the end of our panel talk. I'd like to hand over a question to all of you, and I know it's a hard question. Um, what is your wish for green education, uh, if you had one wish? Maybe we start with Andreas. Yes. More speed, more dynamics. Nazarene. Political will to change. <laughs> Uh, and to ensure that that change is rapid, responsive, and relevant. Yeah. Thank you. Catherine, what would be your wish for the green education in the future? 100% engagement by everybody. Philip, the last words hmm. for Maybe your I, wish. Maybe more responsive educational institutions picking up the knowledge, the solutions that have been created in the private sector and illustrating how we can actually um, solve major sustainability challenges through collaboration. So it's not about individuals and how they carry their lives. It's about how can we combine the people with different competencies together to find solutions that, that work. Together is the most important word nowadays. So thank you very much for this yeah, great panel talk. Thanks for diving with us into the world of green education, for sharing your thoughts with us. All the best to you. Thanks to our panelists and also to our audience for the great questions that came in.
It's time for a short break, a short coffee break of around about 30 minutes. Um, maybe you want to check our website for more information about our speakers. Maybe you want to have a look on our agenda, what's happening this afternoon, what's happening tomorrow um, when we talk about artificial intelligence. And if you want to share your thoughts, your statements, your questions on social media, please use the hashtag FutureTalk2020. We're back in 30 minutes. Stay tuned. See you soon. And um, so the question is, could you give us your individual takeaways of the speech you had before or like the panel discussion? Um, the takeaway from... Permanent learning uh, becomes a um, core element of our society as the environment is changing, as we um, uh, experience right now with this COVID uh, pandemic, um, we see we have to change dramatically fast. And this is always connected with learning. And I think we are in a learning decade, um, uh, unprecedented uh, compared to uh, previous years or decades. or families or people to really interact with each other and to break the boundaries of each discipline and really consider them as, a, as one whole. So before you were talking about um, STEM for education. Did you ask for me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, um, People would be interested in your personal takeaways of the speech you just have in the panel discussion. I think for me it's, it's very important that uh, we uh, expand the classical definition of STEM, not only into arts but also into other competencies like curiosity, creativity, problem solving, teamworking and all these type of things. Because at the end of the day, in our industries, People will also not only need technical skills, but they need also social skills and emotional skills. That's one of the takeaways. 
And the other takeaway is, uh, which is my favorite, uh, we need much more women in STEM jobs and we need to find ways to overcome the current hurdles that we see for young girls to ultimately choose a technical, a scientific, uh, a natural science uh, job instead of uh, going to a bank or into a hospital or wherever. Hello, my name is Danny Gouch, and I'm the Director General of the World.ac Association. World.ac is about connecting organizations, companies, and experts with the intention to encourage dialogue, partnership, and initiatives so as to advance education development and promote innovation. We want to contribute toward improvement of education in all fields and all levels. It's our intention to become the place to go for anyone who has any question with regard to education. We may not directly have the answer, but we are very happy to help you look so that the next time the same question arises, we'll already know it. We look to interact with all stakeholders throughout the education supply chain. And therefore, we encourage companies who value business integrity and ethics, as well as wanting to have a positive impact on education to join us. We encourage teachers, educators, and institution heads to sign up for our different newsletters, which are events, members marketplace, and e-flashes, as well as to follow us on social media to receive updates on innovations and to interact with our members and affiliates at events. You can find us also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We encourage national and regional associations who are dedicated to education to affiliate themselves with World.ac so that the know-how is transferred globally. We encourage NGOs, GEOs, multinational banks, etc., to include World.ac in the planning phases of education projects in order to identify different potential solutions at an early stage. If you'd like to know more about World.ac and see where you can fit in please don't hesitate to contact us. The team and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your time in listening to my message. Good day to all of our participants from around the world and welcome to Future Talk. On behalf of World IDAC, I can say that we are incredibly pleased to bring you this hybrid digital edition of Future Talk. I would like to thank our supporters, the government of Switzerland, our embassy hosts from Finland, Canada, Korea, the mayor of Bern, and of course, our topic sponsors from the UN agencies, UNESCO UNIVOC, UNIDO, and UNESCO UIL. As you may know, Future Talk is one of our recent initiatives to stimulate global dialogue about key educational issues. This is the third edition and is normally held live at our biannual event in Switzerland, which also includes a large exhibition. Due to the COVID pandemic, we've had to postpone the exhibition, but we still want to bring Future Talk to our audience this year in a hybrid and digital online format. Due to the worsening of COVID in Europe, we have had to shift more towards the digital environment and many of our speakers will be joining us from their countries online. This is part of what we are all facing nowadays and we all have to adapt. The important thing is that we still need to work and keep things moving forward. We have to face the challenges for the current crisis, but also need to plan for the future. During these times, it is important to keep the dialogue going, to continue to have input, to discuss, to share, to network and exchange ideas. Therefore, we felt it was our duty to continue with our conference agenda this year, especially during this time. The world has reached a major crossroads in 2020. It is safe to say that the world is changing and so is education. 
This is perhaps the most challenging time in most people's lives and their careers. Change is happening and is both good as well as bad. It was hoped that the pandemic would recede by now, but it is not, and recently has made a comeback in many countries and is even worse than ever before. Over a billion children have been affected by school closures or slowdowns worldwide. The fallout from this may be with us for many years due to lost learning, lost opportunities, and delays in advancement. There are major shifts that are happening in the working population as well. With massive job losses, the collapse of certain types of industries, such as the travel and hospitality sector, many of those job losses may be permanent. And that will leave large numbers of people unemployed, needing to be reskilled and reemployed into other industries. These are our challenges for education for today and for tomorrow. These events have left the world seeking new solutions that might provide a more robust education system that can be more flexible during times of crisis. I encourage our members and viewers that this is the time to support global education in any way that you can. This is a time to make a difference. It is a period to show kindness as well as compassion. It is a time to stay engaged and to seek solution and for ways forward together. At World Didact, we are developing new ways to continue engagement and to help groups come together to exchange ideas and experiences that build connections resulting in solutions that are needed. We are planning to continue to hold international online educational events at several times during the next year. So I ask you to stay tuned and I hope that we can all look forward to you joining us during those events. The World Didact Future Talk is a forum for educational practitioners and the educational industry to come together to share thoughts and ideas, to discuss challenges, and to find solutions to those challenges. We learn from each other, we think together, we explore, and we generate new approaches that can help solve the problems that we are all facing. The Future Talk Conference is part of our expansion of activities to serve the global education community. There is a growing need for educators and solution providers to come together and discuss relevant issues, to seek common cause, and to support and overcome all the challenges that education faces around the world. This applies to both the developed and the developing world. The attitude and needs of education and educators now seems to be changing quite rapidly. Digital learning may become a new pillar of education that has the potential to streamline and accelerate development. We need to adapt solutions and ideas to match with local needs, local conditions, and local aspirations. To do this effectively, it takes a wide community of educational practitioners, educational developers, educational manufacturers, advisors, and financial supporters. Not just from one part of the world, but from the entire world. It takes an international community of concerned individuals, companies, and government organizations to do this. If we can harness the energy of these groups of visionaries, practitioners, and enablers, we can accelerate and find amazing solutions together. During this week's event, each day you'll be treated to a wonderful lineup of experts on a series of topics. We have three themes this year. Each half-day session has a UN sponsor and also a host from World Didact. The first day, today, November 4th, will be STEM or STEAM with a keynote from UNESCO Institute of Lifelong Learning and our World Didact Director General, Danny Gausch, as host. The second day, tomorrow, is the greening of education with a keynote from UNESCO Univoc and our World Didact Vice President, Dr. Nader Imani, as host. The third day, November 6th, is about AI, Artificial Intelligence, Industrial Revolution 4.0, with a sub-focus on digital learning. There is a keynote from UNIDO, and I will be the World Didact host on that day. For your information, we are currently considering to host a special edition event on digital and online learning that we hope will be coming up in a future event early next year, as we really need to discuss a lot more about this key area. These three themes are all important, and I think that relevant not just in pre-COVID times, but truly relevant during the current crisis and afterwards as well. I'd like to inform you that we have a networking app that is available to use. The name of this is called WOVA and is shown on the link above in this uh, presentation. This will allow you to see additional information and to connect with key participants and speakers from around the world. I suggest that if you've not registered for this, you might consider doing so, as this is still the first day, and there's a lot of networking that could yet still be done. It will certainly add a new dimension to your engagement and participation. There are several hundred WOVA participants already online for this event, 
and the more the better. In future editions, we may be able to bring to you virtual exhibitions and highlights and side events, or even discussion groups. This is part of our program in trying to make these events more engaging and interactive. Future Talk is part of the new vision of World Didact. It is where education comes together to discuss issues and challenges and to find solutions to these problems, not just to dialogue about them. Development does not happen by accident. It takes planning, collaboration, implementation, and dedication to manage the process. World Didact's new vision is to connect organizations, companies, and experts to encourage dialogue, partnership, and initiatives, and to advance educational development and promote innovation. Our motto is World Didact, where education comes together. During this time of 2020, we are all facing many challenges brought about by the COVID crisis. It's more important than ever to work together to transform education to make it better and more equitable for all. So I invite you to come and join us. Make this possible. Expand our global network together. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me or any of the other World Didact staff or council members on the WOVA app. That is what it is for. So I hope you enjoy the conference and that each of you finds something useful. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Gerd Leonhard, Futurist and Humanist in Zurich. Uh, really great pleasure to be with you today for all three days of the Future Talk Forum in Bern in Switzerland. Uh, albeit, of course, I'll be there remotely with you. But uh, I'll kick this off with the first session uh, that's going to be about uh, education and future foresights on uh, this, what's called STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts and Math. Um, and I will have two other juicy topics for you tomorrow. Let's start right here and by analyzing what's happening right now, it's really quite clear. We're in a period of great transformation and disruption and also of hardship, I think, with the COVID crisis, economic, personal, social hardship. But we're now transitioning into a new world where things that used to be on top have landed at the bottom like flying, like cruise ships, oil and gas, and Bitcoin, and you know all the practical things of a developed industrial society. Now we have new things on the top, technology, healthcare, working from home, uh, the whole discussion about how we're going to live in a sustainable world, and who does what, and, and uh, globalization and government, it's all new topics. There's a new narrative forming, and I call this a great transformation, which is a huge chance for us to reset. Some people talk about the Great Reset, the World Economic Forum does, and, and many other people have other terms for it. But here's an interesting cover design from uh, Time magazine also talking about the Great Reset. That is the time that's happening right now. And so next year should be really quite exciting if, of course, still very difficult. We're not going to head out of the corona crisis anytime soon next year, maybe at the end of next year, if we're lucky. We're living in a world that is not returning to normal. Whatever you thought about normal, uh, I thought you know normal wasn't good enough, but we're not going back there. We're not going back to a place where we travel as usual, we burn fossil fuel as usual, we have the same jobs, we work from the office. That is being rethought in every country around the world. Here in Switzerland, things are a little bit different, and we are often slower in responding to this, but yeah. We're not going back to normal, we're going to a set of new normals. We're going into a world that is essentially warp drive into the future. And when you think about it, education and vocational training and what we have to learn in this world, basically the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. And this is not an overstatement. And we're essentially going uh, into that future gradually, then suddenly, you know, everything's kind of going slowly like uh, cloud computing or quantum computing or the Internet of Things or technology, and boom, it's there. All of a sudden, we have a legal music service, several of them, and music is in the cloud. That took 10 years. So gradually, then suddenly, is borrowed from a Hemingway novel, of course. But basically, what we see here is the pandemic is a great accelerator of the things that were already there before. If there was inequality, we have more of it now. If there was political distrust, we have more of it now. If there's good things like working from home, uh, doing remote teaching, remote learning, learning in the cloud, 
that is exploding. So I'm going to show you a couple of those key trends, very important, I think, when we talk about education and the future to look at this. Online learning and training is exploding, and that's going to take a huge boost from virtual reality, from augmented reality, holograms. But having said that, of course, everybody knows that online learning is not the same than person to person uh, meet space, you know, uh, real life learning. It's it, it's great, but it's different. And I'll talk about that later. Why that is? A virtual video conference, as we do now, that is etc. It's called telemedicine, telehealth. Yeah, people are now saying, well, maybe I don't have to go to the doctor. It may be risky, so I'm going to do a remote consultation. The, the doctor on demand here on your, on your Apple Watch, right? <laughs> E-commerce, online media is exploding. We're moving into a world where everything is all of a sudden, yeah, it, it seems like it was gradual, and now boom is here, working from home. Right? In Switzerland, we have always worked from home quite a bit, and we have good resources, networks, mobile networks, uh, wireless networks, and so on for all of that. But it's, this is definitely also a huge challenge in our mindset. And what do we need to know to work from home? And the skills we need in the office are really quite different than the ones we need from home. I think we're in a time of great transformation, uh, a time of great reset, you know, where we essentially are, uh, as Buckminster Fuller liked to say, the great futurist, uh, at a fork in the road. Right? Uh, it is a place where we have to make sure that we take the right turn towards the sunny part of that road, not the dark part. And, and what would education for a new world look like? And how do we train our skills for that new world? The next 10 years, more changes than the previous 100 years? Well, what do we need to know? What kind of skills do we need? Probably not at all the same than 10 years ago. We're living in a world that is exponentially fast uh, and also exponentially challenging. Right? It, it's not actually four, five, six, seven, eight uh, for, uh, anymore. It's, it's, it's exploding. It's doubling. An exponential curve, Moore's Law, Metcalfe's Law, 4, 8, 16, 32, go up the scale a few times, you're at 1 billion. So our kids are going to see a world that's exponentially different, and that change will be absolutely mind-boggling in terms of what is becoming possible, what we have to know. But it could also be very rewarding because we can solve global problems this way that have been there for quite some time. I often use this image of the mega shifts and the game changes. Uh, and here are the 10 game changes that we're currently seeing around us, technological game changes. And I think we've seen those for a while, like 3D printing or intelligent machines or blockchain. But they're finally all coming together and creating new possibilities. I mean, if it wasn't for all this technology, the cloud, the mobile, the analytics, we probably have a lot more people in the hospital and, and even dying than we have now. I mean, this is a bad enough number, but think about what happened in World War I with the swine flu, 60 million people. And now we have the tech to coordinate and, and to make this easier. So basically what's happening all around us, this is what we have to know. What's happening with virtuality and quantum computing? And you can read more about that if you just go to uh, Game Changes on Google and put in my name. You'll see. But basically what's happening here is really quite simple, is that technology is no longer just exponential. It's also com converging the industries right? and creating combinatorial results. So, for example, many companies are now experiencing that they are becoming tech companies, right? the biotechnology companies, for example, genetic engineering uh, and e-commerce. Everybody, Everything is around technology now. And education is going the same path. There's going to be a huge amount of investment in technology, and huge possibilities of new sources, but it comes down still to one thing, you know, humans learn best with and other, other humans uh, through engagement and experiences. And that's going to remain, I think, the cornerstone of education and training in the future. Apart from those three things that we see all around us, you know, everything is in the cloud, our movies, our books, uh, everything else. Everything is becoming intelligent, so-called, but I think that word is actually quite bad. It's more like... Yeah, becoming smart rather than intelligent. <laughs> but if we set this aside for a minute, what is happening on top of this is this kind of convergence of humans and machines. Uh, as we look around us, it's quite clear that you know every day there's more technology to support us and to help us and sometimes also to affect us and to infect us, so to speak, like social networks uh, or gaming or virtuality. Now we have to ask a question, what does it mean all for education? And what does it mean for what we have to learn, what skills we have? It's quite clear that computers are getting quite skillful, 
not in any human sense, right? but the routine is probably going to be done by machines. You know, any routine, really, as long as it's understandable by machines, for example, a call center or researching, or filing, connecting. You know, we're already using lots and lots of tools that are kind of intelligent, uh, kind of, for the most part. Right? So I think it's safe to say my favorite movie, Blade Runner, uh, uh, has set forth, you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> well, the first one, right? Science fiction is becoming science fact. And, and I think I have observed that all around me, wherever you look, science fiction that used to be, you know, kind of theoretically possible but not happening is all around us. For example, now we are speaking to computers and they understand us. Not very well yet, but I mean, you could see where this is going. In five years, you could speak to your machine and ask any question. Uh, and, and it won't even be a machine. It could just be your wristwatch or the wall. Right? And you can get pretty smart answers. You can probably sit at home and enjoy the internet delivering everything to you. I call this a sofa larity, kind of like the singularity. <laughs> uh, you can do uh, 3D printing of many, many objects, including shoes and electric devices, electronic devices, and of course, body parts like kneecaps and earlobes. And that's already here, but just give it 10 years and we'll see what that future will bring. And of course, machines are now becoming intelligent and they're becoming also uh, uh, assistant to us. So telemedicine, being able to have remote diagnostics could reduce hospital visits by 80% if used correctly. And this is clearly the way that Apple is going and others. And last not least, machines are learning. Are they learning like us? No. But they, they can certainly look at a lot of patterns. IBM Watson's AI can read basically, uh, I think, one million books in, in two minutes and, uh, and store all this information that humans can't. Machine learning, deep learning, and language understanding. Right? I mean, imagine what that means when a computer can speak to you and actually understand when you speak like with a person, which is not quite there, but soon will be. Um, we're going to see stuff like this as a great uh, project by Waverly Labs. It's a translation device. How did last night's assignment go? Can I that? Um, think about education. I mean, you can speak in 30 languages or, or receive information in, in 30 languages and send WhatsApps in 50 languages in real time. Or you can use Facebook's uh, so-called infinite office, which allows you to uh, dive into the virtual world right, and understand what's happening there, like Tom Cruise and Minority Report. Imagine if we had that now. Yeah, it could be heaven, it could be hell, but think about the impact on education and learning and development of this. It could be too good to be true in many ways. So we're heading into the future where what I call the mega shifts in my first book, in my recent book, uh, it's becoming even more important. And these are not just technology, they're also social shifts. And, and they're like a matrix of things that are interacting all the time. And if we look at those there, uh, you can have a look at the website, megashifts.digital, where you can download the whole chapter, uh, all, the, all in like 12 languages. But it's interactively uh, uh, impacting each other. So we have augmentation, we have robotization, we have cognification uh, systems becoming smart. We have uh, machines that understand other machines and can find patterns and do things that used to be humans doing this kind of work, which is probably still on the lower level of cognitive work. But of course, automation will be much bigger change than globalization has ever been. Uh, and this map of changes, you know, virtualization, what technology does, is going to be mind-boggling uh, in terms of what it can do for us and which way we can go. So I think the mega shifts are going to impact all of the sciences and engineering and math, but they will also push us toward, towards a world that's about hecky, right? Humanity, ethics, creativity, and imagination, because machines will be, do, be able to do so much more logical work. And we're going to be in an entirely different world that's uh, kind of not uh, to get too traditional here with the brain halves, but it's not going to be just about IQ and smartness. It's going to be about EQ, right? The human factor, the emotional quotient, emotional intelligence. And that just means basically being human uh, and having compassion. And how do you develop that? You know, can you go to school for this? Can you get an MBA in emotions? 
And so I think our future holds that STEM will still be very important. It's all about technology. But on the other hand, the humanities are coming back. Huh? Humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. I'll call that HECI as an abbreviation as opposed to STEM. So those two things will be balanced very much in our future. And we're going to see a huge momentum uh, on the curriculum in schools to go back to this, but also in companies to have training for curiosity training for imagination, training for intuition. And you can see in this uh, amazing chart here from the World Economic Forum, the future of jobs, what we see here is that companies are looking to accelerate digitization and remote work opportunities and automation. Clearly, it's all about tech. And amazingly, you know, we, we, we see quite a few people who want to reassign workers, but not too many that want to basically completely decrease the workforce, if you're being honest. But, you know, businesses have to adopt, and this is where we're going, and that's going to force us to be better humans and have better skills in the future. That's clearly going to be a very, very big change. I always say that the future is not an extension of the present or the past. The future is, is new. And whatever has worked until now, great. Will that work in the future? Unlikely. The music business does not sell CDs anymore, even though they, they still do, right? But you may have still bought one. <laughs> but it's in the cloud. It's different. The future is not the same than the past. It's an extension of the future coming backwards. So very important for us to realize in our, in our, in our training and our future skills, what we teach our kids or our employees, right? we have to teach them the future. We have to teach them what they may need tomorrow. Right? In this sort of upside down world that we're clearly seeing here, these waves are all over us, right? First the COVID wave, challenging us, challenging our existence, our survival, then climate change, which is the next thing. And of course, after that, a new economic logic. How would you understand this? Well, you have to have what I call a future mindset right? and get ready to educate yourself on the future. So this wraps up my first session. And Tomorrow I'll be back and I'll talk about uh, green futures and what that means for education and of course the next day with yet another one. Thanks very much for tuning in and I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Dear Excellencies, welcome back to the second half of today's future talk. We all had a short coffee break, cappuccino, espresso. I hope you did the same and that you have power for the next panel discussion. Panel discussion number two. I'm looking forward to introduce our three panelists. The topic of our panel talk is this, how does digitalization help to ramp up greening education? How can we develop an institutional TVET greening plan to generate jobs, to have the right skills for employability, for purpose economies, and for new business models? We will discuss this with three experts, with our three panelists that are joining us via video call, and here they are. I say a warm welcome to Stefan Hovig, Chief of Staff and Communications Officer at the ADECO Group. Um, nice to be here, thank you. Hello, Stephen. Good to have you thank here. You. Hi. Thank you. I also want to welcome Olga Stritska Ilina, Senior Skills and Employability Specialist and Team Leader of the International Labor Organization, ILO. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you. Olga, good to have you here in this panel. Thanks for joining us. And last but not least, Mrs. Gabriela Uriate, lead of LAP Project and Leading Women Area at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WSBD. Hello, Gabriela. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me to join this, this panel. We're happy to have you here. And for all our viewers, all our guests, please use the Whova app for posting your questions into the app. They will appear here on my mobile phone and I will hand the questions over to our panelists. So please be interactive, send your comments, send your questions. I will hand them over um, while, during or after our panel talk. 
So, let's start with question number one. I'd like to hand over the first question um, to Stefan Hovig. Stefan, ADECO is the world's leading provider for personal services with about 35,000 employees in about 60 countries. So, some key facts. With this background, uh, what do you think? What can be done to ensure digitalization optimizes the greening plan for employability? What is very important? Very important question. Thank you so much. I think the most important precondition for success will involve efforts and flexibility from not only the individuals, but also from companies like ours and all the other companies around the globe in the sector and the governments as well as training institutions. In this respect, I would like to highlight an initiative by the European Commission, who has early on realized that by 2030, 375 million people will need to be retrained and reskilled. And in this respect, they are championing the Pact of Skills that aims to mobilize and encourage all relevant stakeholders to take concrete actions for upskilling, reskilling of people of age, of people who have to switch. Um, from fuel engines, we have heard that before, into electric and into electric vehicles. And in addition to that, they have early on also realized that vocational and educational training is absolutely key to success. I'm very honored to be since four years a pan-European ambassador for the vo vocational and educational training. And we all know that um, with a VET you have a high chance to enter the workforce almost immediately when you have graduated. And with this, I think that companies, if I take the Adeco Group and Modis, our global technology brand, need to take initiatives like our Modis Academy, where we train young engineers, people in coding, in the smart industry, and all of that supports then our purpose to make the future work for everyone. Back to you. Thanks, uh, Stefan. Olga, you are Senior Skills and Employability Specialist at the International Labour Organization, ILO. Can you tell us how will transition to the green economy and climate action impact jobs and skills? And what is the role of digitalization and technological change in this process? Thank you for the question and also thank you for inviting the ILO to this magnificent event. I think it's a super important question that we're discussing today uh, because the world has been concentrating on the disruptive nature of technological change and not really uh, spending enough uh, time and uh, paying enough attention to the question of the green transition. So in the ILO, we uh, implemented uh, in 2019 uh, research which produced an estimate a global estimate of the job impact in two scenarios. I think this was actually mentioned in the uh, keynote speech, this, uh, this study. Uh, the two scenarios, one is a transition to the renewable energy uh, economy, and another one is a transition to the circular economy, also already explained earlier by previous speakers. So cumulatively, and it's, it's a good reason that we can treat this data cumulatively because they are not, these two scenarios are not mutually exclusive. They are uh, actually uh, complementary. Cumulatively, this policies implementation may create globally over 100 million jobs. This is huge, especially in the context of the current crisis, health crisis and the followed economic crisis and job crisis. This is something what the world will need very much. But in the short term, there might be also some negative effects on jobs. So around 50 million jobs may be negatively affected. Uh, some of them are destroyed, but most of them actually will find similar occupations in the growing industries. These people will be able to relocate within the same occupation in the same country. They will need just a little bit of retraining. It's light, but they will need this retraining. And at the same time, there will be enough new jobs created that will require initial preparation through vacation education and training. And they will, this will also require retrain those people who lose their jobs without the creation of similar jobs in growing sectors. 
And that training will require major retraining, potentially a requalification and a new qualification. That is a major investment. This is one point I would like to make. It will require a major investment through lifelong learning. And this, this will require also uh, collaboration by the private sector, government, and individuals investing into training, retraining, reskilling, and upskilling opportunities. There will be enough jobs created, not only among environmental scientists, not only higher education, but also those people who are trained vocationally, such as assemblers, such as manufacturing workers, sales workers, construction workers, plumbers. They all will need to uh, have an opportunity to retrain. And also we know that these jobs will be mostly affecting uh, middle skill level and lower skill level. Uh, and it also happens that mostly these occupations are occupied by male. So we actually need to also to provide retraining for women, for lower skilled people, so that everybody can reap the benefits of the transition. Now, coming to your second part of the question about digitalization, how does digitalization come into the whole picture? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, when we say digitalization, of course, it's a bit of a generalization because digitalization doesn't happen to the same degree in the same sector, in, in different sectors and in different countries. And the situation is quite different in agricultural sector of uh, the Netherlands, for example, which is very high tech compared to the agricultural sector in uh, African countries, low income African countries. Uh, so this has to be taken into account. But nevertheless, digitalization technological change does penetrate everywhere and in all countries and in all sectors to different extent that it does. And it may have a positive effect on, uh, on greening if it's an investment towards uh, the green, green activities, green jobs. But if it's an investment towards digitalization of, for example, fossil fuel-based energy generation, it will be counterproductive. So it's all really about what our choices, our policy choices are. And also we need to take into account that uh, digitalization is also another disruptor in addition to the uh, disruptive nature also of the tr green transition itself, which I already mentioned. So they actually come together and we need to make sure that people are uh, prepared. So my argument is that we need to invest, but we also need to invest into training to prepare people to that jobs, which we know will appear. And we have to know, we have to anticipate, we have to have the labor market information. Uh, so this we have to do just in time so that people get the jobs and they get the opportunities in the green economy. But also we need to retrain people just in case for those jobs where we don't know, because the, we have to recognize the disruptive nature of the, of the changes. And for this, we need to supply them with soft skills, with transferable skills, with skills that provide some level of resilience to the change as well. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. I also saw Stefan uh, nodding, agreeing to what Olga said. We want an interactive uh, talk. So if you want to add something, please feel free to do so. Yeah. I just, I, I mean, we have together with the ILO um, worked on the future of work report and stated there the need of a social contract, of a new social contract. And I think in that, um, um, let's say, governments, companies, individuals, we need to we need to establish a lifelong learning account for everyone, which is nurtured by all parties, mm. really in order to what Olga is saying, to make sure that those shifts we have heard yesterday, today, that those shifts are not leaving people behind, but really that we build bridges so that everyone um, can participate in the exciting future. Because net, mm. I believe there are mu mu more jobs in the future than we'll have today. But we have to make sure we take everyone with us. Absolutely. Leave no one behind in that case. Yes. Thank you, Stefan. Gabriela, hola. Thanks for tuning in hola. from España. Um, Gabriela, you represent today the World Council for Sustainable Development, which embraces about 200 leading global companies working together to accelerate a transition to a sustainable world. And of course, diversity and um, gender equity is a top agenda item for your organization. So from your perspective, what is the role of women in the very important case, sustainability? Well, um Probably and hopefully everyone knows so far that when 
there are more women at top level positions within the companies, these are more productive, more innovative, and more competitive. And it's not me who says so. There are many, many serious studies not that reach to this conclusion. But moreover, companies that have more women at these uh, decision-making positions tend to be more sustainable. Then the United Nations state that women play a crucial role on the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And I, I really support this. Now, women, we play a key role for sustainable development, not only at the economical level, but also at the environmental and social level, right? And um, what is this sustainable development now? It's not just like facing climate issues. From my point of view, and I'm putting it in, in simple words, sustainable development is about progressing, but without destroying. It's about progressing, of course, at the economical level, but also at the environmental and social level. And then if we go back to the women issue, right? Uh, women develop, we develop special skills that help to achieve the sustainable development uh, within business. No? And these skills, according to the uh, Better uh, Leadership, Better World Report of uh, Women Rights in 2030, these skills are social inclusion, environmental issues, and innovation, of course, as well, collaboration and global vision, transparency, and recruiting and retaining talent and so on. So it's, it's good news. It's, it's good news to, to know that the business world is waking up to, to include these skills into their executive levels. And I'm, I'm talking about including skills, not including women, eh? mm -hmm. which, which it's, it's linked. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's a matter of, it's not just because a matter of justice or balance or, or, or of being fair, which of course it is, but it's because a matter of competitiveness. Hmm. Back to you. Thank you, Gabriela. Stefan, besides your executive role at ADECO, you're also an ambassador for young people at the European Union. So could you tell us, why would you encourage someone, maybe at school or looking for a change of career direction that happens often at the moment, to acquire digital skills if they want to make a contribution to a cleaner and a less resource-intensive world? I, I mean, I, if I look back to my career, I have probably done 18 different jobs, so I have switched my profile and my, my career quite, quite, some, some, yeah, quite some shifts and numerous times, always with the pleasure and with the, let's say, with the privilege to also search for my interests and to fulfill my interests. What I'm deeply convinced is that working for greater good is something that most people dream of. It's a privilege, but I think it's something that companies need to really understand. And then if I look at the green economy and link that to vocational and educational training, green economy for me is not just electric cars, solar panel, renewable energy. Green economy starts with the traditional economy. I think it's a combination between what digital and digitization allows us today and the existing economy being in burn today um, with, the, with the panel. Um, it's the headquarter of the Swiss railway. And if I look to the Swiss railway, <clears throat> they have saved an enormous amount of energy by putting digital control systems into their trains. So it's a good example where you see that Today, you take traditional, like a hundred year and more traditional um, industry, and you add digital to massively save energy. Why do I take that case? That case demonstrates if you do an apprenticeship at the Swiss Railway, you would see that today in each apprentice, digital is a key component. I, tr I was trained as a mechanic. Today, the same profile is a polymechanic with a lot of digital elements in it. So the influence of digital 
into vocational training and vice versa is phenomenal. And for me, it is actually the digital education that needs to be not a luxury, but it has to be an essential tool in everybody's education. Um, Olga mentioned before on an assembly line, wherever you are, I think that's really important. And that's also what we see as a company mm. that we have acquired um, General Assembly, a company where we help people to do coding um, in different areas. You can do that remote. You don't have to go on campus. And I think that's the access to the future for everyone everywhere. Back to you. Thank you, Stefan. Olga, I have one more question that I'd like to hand over to you. What are the biggest skills, challenges, and needs to ensure the smooth transition that we all will feel and see in the next years, months? Yes, thank you for the question. I, uh, I think um, smooth is the key question, is the key word there, smooth, because of course now we will transit this way or the other, mm -hmm. but it's in, in the interest of the society to make the transition as smooth and as just as, as possible. So the human-centered agenda, which was mentioned by Stefan and which is also the underlying principle of the ILO centenary declaration is key. And actually, in the ILO, also we have this um, approach, which we call just transition, which now became very embedded also in climate talks. So this is one of uh, key, thing, uh, key themes there. Uh, just transition is a comprehensive approach, which also includes uh, not only skills development, but also other policy areas, such as uh, social protection, active labor market policies, and uh, enterprise development, and so on. This is the approach, so that nobody is left behind and everybody gets a chance. And having said that, the key problem is coherence and coordination of policies and of activities as well. You know, if, if we look at uh, countries last year when we, we produced the research, we looked in depth in the experiences of 32 countries and compared that with um, the progress uh, during the last 10 years. And in fact, you can see it's uh, an array of uh, very, very encouraging uh, skills development approaches and Still, we face the same challenge. There are skill shortages, there are skill gaps that prevent uh, companies and um, also governments to implement the, the policies, uh, the policy uh, of uh, environmental change, climate action. Uh, so this is really coordination and then also already mentioned by speakers uh, from the previous panel, social dialogue. This is not just, uh, you know, it's not, just a lip service uh, about the importance of involvement of the private sector. But without uh, building on social dialogue, we cannot really translate the knowledge, uh, the information about labor market developments, given the pace of change and the disruptive nature into the world of education and training. This is the key. And now, which, which skills? Of course, you know, it, again, we can go into details. Um, and it, it will take quite a lot of time. But I think if, if uh, to answer that question in short, it's a combination of foundational skills. So it's um, literacy, numeracy, um, digital skills, and as well as um, basic environmental awareness and knowledge. I, I would count them as foundational skills that allow people to learn in the future, to build on that during their lifelong learning. It's um, a combination of uh, soft skills especially those ones that actually allow people to uh, adapt, to, to be more resilient to change, to climate change, as well as uh, disruptive changes such as the one we're living through now. Uh, people, to allow people to uh, be more creative, to um, uh, implement systemic changes, uh, design thinking, analytical thinking, communication and, and networking, as well as leadership skills, because without... Um, Capable leadership without capable uh, management and, 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 and business thinking and entrepreneurship, we will not achieve uh, the, the green change in the future, as well as uh, um, consumer service, consumer advice, uh, marketing. In fact, I can give you an example. A plumber who comes to a household becomes an advocate of the green change, because if he is aware about different uh, green solutions to 
um, renew renewable energy, uh, water heating system, for example, um, he or water saving technologies as well. He becomes an advocate of the green transition for this household. So it's very important to green uh, these kind of professions and their knowledge, as well as hard skills. So this is the last component. It's much easier to reskill a good construction worker or a good engineer into the uh, into occupation uh, in one of growing industries than the one that misses basic uh, has gaps in the in the in the core of of, uh, of the occupation. So it's the relevance of training to the labor market which is really important. And also from the point of view of skills development, vocation education, and training. We need to incorporate more of transferable skills, not necessarily soft, it's clear, soft skills are transferable, but also semi-hard skills, um, such as the budgeting, scheduling, recycling, uh, energy water saving. These are all transferable semi-technical skills that need to be incorporated into the curriculum development and competency standards. Over to you. Thanks, Olga. Gabriella, your organization set up LEAP or LEAP. Can you tell us what LEAP stands for and what the objectives are? Yeah, well, well uh, as you as you very well said before, WPCSD, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, it's a global private organization of more than 200 uh, leading companies. They are the biggest companies of the world. Uh, we, we were formally created um, 25 years ago, and we, we look for, for a more than a necessary purpose, which is to make business more sustainable while remaining competitive, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like having a positive impact on the shareholders, but also on for the planet and for the society. And as I said before, this sustainability issue is, is about progressing without destroying at both economical, but also environmental and social levels. No. So if we go to the social level, social sphere, this implies, and you said before as well, the gender uh, equality, no? equal opportunities between men and women. And that is exactly with what tackles uh, SDG number five. Um, as I said before, or linked with what I, what I said before as well, gender equality adds value to business, right? Despite this, and despite common sense, data are not very encouraging. Well, they're quite depressing, no? Mm -hmm. Only 5% of companies are uh, led by women. Only 20% is the share of uh, women at boards. Only 25% is the share of uh, women at the executive committees and so on and so on. So at WBCSD, we've decided to take action and we launch uh, this program addressed to company, but focused on women and sustainability. It's called LEAP, LEAP meaning jump ahead. Mm -hmm. LEAP meaning jump ahead, not only for women, but also for business, no? And we combine these two elements that I consider to be uh, unbreakable, women and sustainability. And what, what we try to achieve with, with LEAP is to make business more sustainable, but using, but through women. We have two different goals. We help women to promote within their business, but also we train them on sustainability. So we make sure that once they reach those top level positions, the sustainability is embedded in their leadership and in their company strategy. This project is a one year project with three different face-to-face uh, -face models face-to-face -face, uh, a part of this uh, coronavirus situation, but there is one face-to-face -face week at Yale University, uh, which is 100% training on sustainability. We also visit uh, United Nations, so they, they share there the sustainable development goals. Then there is a second model, a second face-to-face uh, -face week at ESADE Business School in Madrid, where we, where we train them on a general management program. It's an intensive mini MBA, let's say. And then the third model, it's uh, during our council member meeting uh, where we gather every year the presidents and CEOs of our companies in order to share the best practices on sustainability issues. So we invite the participants uh, to join us there. 
the companies that like to participate at LEAP, they need to propose a woman manager, let's say, or directive in a, in a position already of responsibility, mm -hmm. but also a mentor. And these mentors should come from the highest uh, levels of executives of the company. I'm talking about the president, the okay. CEO, general managers. And these uh, people are going to, uh, they could uh, be either, even men or women. Okay. These people are going to mentor a woman participant from a different company. So what we would like to tackle with this cross mentorship process, it's both to help the women participants to develop their professional plans, but also we would like to raise awareness in the companies through these mentors on gender equality issues. Mm -hmm. Because what I always say is that what I don't share with my president, Peter Bakker, regarding the obstacles I may found um, in order to be promoted at WBCSD. I do share them with the president of ADECO, for instance, not because she or he's not my boss. Mm -hmm. And he's going to think, oh, what happens to Gabriela at WBCSD? Mm -hmm. Gabriela, who's very smart, and she cannot break the, this glass ceiling. Yeah, yeah. It might be happening at ADECO, no? And, and then she goes, or he goes back to the, to the HR or training departments in order to, or diversity departments, in order to, to, to help with and support different initiatives, no? So what we, what we try to do is to, to, to raise awareness in the, in the companies, no? With, with this program. And uh, we try to transform the, the business world. We try to transform the companies in order to make them become a little bit better. What a great That's idea, what a great plan that will work out for sure. Thanks for sharing um, this idea, these plans, this project, LEAP, with us and also uh, with our viewers. And to our viewers, thank you. I received good questions. I will hand them over to you as soon as possible, but I have some more questions here on my tablet that we prepared, and the next one is uh, to you, Stefan. Uh, what effect do you think will the pandemic have on the greening of education and the application of digital technology? I will answer the question in a second. I just want to, to emphasize the point Gabriela made to sure. make it a bit interactive. Um, I truly believe that um, it's not only the sustainability that makes company in the future successful and differentiates them in the market. It is also the reason why young people join companies. And if we see the talent shortage, it has to be, um, it has to be expressed. Now, regarding women, um, I strongly believe, so does our CEO, it has to start with hard targets. Uh, companies do not, do not usually change just out of, of intrinsic motivation. So we have, or he has set a clear target that um, by 2030, we have 50-50. On the way, I think programs like Gabriela has highlighted are absolutely crucial. We have programs, our chief HR set up programs where we as executives fast track young female leaders. We identify, we mentor them. Each, each and every executive has three to five female leaders. And it's a positive discrimination. I have an executive search out at the moment where I clearly say, I, it's a female only search. And I think those instruments are absolutely key. And then on top, if companies can also mentor cross and, and inspire each other, I think that's even better. So now coming to your question. <laughs> Thank you for the pandemic, <laughs> Very, very quickly. I think the pandemic has amplified many aspects. Uh, um, we're still, facing the pandemic and, um, and have learned a lot, but also um, it, has, um, it has had severe um, impact on society and on business. And we will see more to come, unfortunately. So the desire, I think, to build a better and more sustainable world in that environment we are in has been amplified next to fast forward at least 10 years on the digital side. The importance to reskill and upskill to lifelong learning, 
has also been one element that has been amplified through digital. We know today what is possible, um, like we do conferences. We have reduced our global travel, and I have been traveling roughly three to four days a week, um, now by pandemic to almost zero. And we will keep that, not the zero, but we will really set targets to reduce the travel and um, with that also contribute to, um, yeah, to, a better, to a better environment and to a better world. And with that, and what I said before on vocational and educational training and Olga um, nicely laid out the different skills that we need to apply, new skills that we need to learn, soft, hard skills, transversional skills, I think are instrumental to make the future work for everyone. And that's the purpose we share and should nurture each and every one of us. Back to you. You're so right, Stefan. Thank you very much. Olga, what do you think? What are the key policy pillars in skills development and lifelong learning for just transition? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would like actually to build a little bit on what Stefan yeah, was talking about now in the context of the COVID-19. We have just implemented um, another survey, another piece of research together with UNESCO and the World Bank on the effects of the COVID-19 on the uh, training provision in vocational education and training, both initial as well as adult learning. And we know that the, the disruption has been major, really. We know that uh, training centers closures affected, uh, partial, partial or full closures affected 99% of providers, of training providers, imagine that, 99%. Uh, full closures, 95%. This is enormous. This is absolutely enormous. And we, we saw uh, that there was so much initiative on the side of uh, uh, training providers to still try to switch to distance learning, high tech or low tech. Distance learning doesn't have to be online. Um, but at the same time, there have been so many problems. So I think we, we've been asking ourselves, has vacation education training passed the COVID-19 test? And the answer is, it, it did, but not without problems, really. And this is because there is no uh, enough capacity on the side of teachers. There is not enough capacity on the side of learners. There are no uh, enough platforms, well-working platforms, learning platforms and resource materials. Mm -hmm. And most of all, uh, in developing countries, we also have to face, this, face it there is a major problem with access to infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, with a level of connectivity. So this has to be uh, really uh, recognized because the situation is not the same uh, around the world. So if these underlying difficulties are not resolved, then digitalization will not work for the social cohesion and equity. It will be actually counterproductive. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to think about high-tech solution, digitalization as well as low-tech solution, and also think about the connectivity issue and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, about your question about the pillars. I already said something about uh, policy coherence. For me, it's really the key so that different ministries as well as different policies talk to each other. So let's take, for example, um, nationally determined contributions. So these are the programs every country produces, uh, showing the commitment of the country to meet the objectives of the uh, Paris uh, 2015 climate change agreement. Uh, we looked into that. We know that less than half of those plans have some provisions in skills development. This is not satisfactory enough. Uh, so this is something to, 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 to think about. And also for this, we need uh, well-functioning institutional platforms at national level, and then we very much support sector level because at sector level, you can actually uh, cre create platforms where private sector and education training providers talk to each other in a meaningful way. Uh, and also at the, at the level of granularity, allowing to look into the skill needs at the competency level, which is uh, super important for the training provision, adjustment of the training provision. So this is the... Um, basics of the of the social dialogue. We support very much, much sectoral approaches around the world, um, and I always very heavily 
engaged in supporting countries in that. And then capacity development. It's not only institution building, but also capacities of, uh, of those people, those stakeholders which are involved to be aware of what are the green mechanisms. So what, is, what does it mean, greening products, greening services in different sectors? What will it imply in terms of job tasks and therefore also skills? How will it then affect um, occupations and jobs? And also, therefore, how can we mainstream those green skills into the curricula, into competency standards, into qualification systems, and uh, so on. Now, many people mentioned that a lot of policy initiative happens, but implementation is a problem. And this is what we know from our research in 2011 and the same finding in 2019. It's very, very disappointing. A lot of initiative, but when it comes to implementation, it's not satisfactory at all. So for this, we need uh, very efficient um, evaluation and monitoring mechanisms and also budgetary mechanisms so that there is a accountability, the, the uh, shared uh, tasks and divisions between different stakeholders, and everybody is accountable for the, for the implementation. Uh, we can also monitor the system and understand what works uh, well, what doesn't work well, and then introduce what works well in the future of policymaking and the formulation of policies. And then last but not least, I already mentioned comprehensive approaches. And it's important, of course, not only to provide lifelong learning opportunities, but also um, some social protection measures so that people who transfer from job to job and they would like to retrain, they have some level of sustained income and they have this uh, comfort of going through training without uh, putting at risk their, their household and the income of the household. This is important. And also for the just transition measures, it's important also to uh, rely on uh, active labor market policies with some targeted approaches to uh, vulnerable, disadvantaged group, groups, uh, low-skilled and women already mentioned today. This is also super important. But one thing, everybody speak about lifelong learning as a new concept. It's not new. It's been around for several decades already, and it still doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? I think this is something maybe everybody can reflect about. Mm -hmm. And I think it doesn't work because we don't have enough operational guidelines. What does make a lifelong learning system a system? So what will be the financial mechanisms that would provide motivation to learn for individuals, but also would allow every party, private sector, government and individuals to benefit from that and also to contribute to that system? in terms of shared responsibility or financing. What will be the incentives? What should be the institutions? What should be the decision-making behind it? We can't just put the lifelong learning um, weight on the shoulders of individuals alone. That will not work, especially now in the situation when we know that they will have more and more workers in the platform economy. They're not covered by the, the regular uh, employment contract. Uh, there is no obligation of an employer to uh, provide training to such workers. So they should not be left behind. Mm -hmm. Everybody should be somehow included in order to reap the benefits of the green transition. If there will be jobs created, and we know there will be many jobs created, the, the employment change will be positive. But we have to think about these mechanisms to make lifelong learning, learning system function for all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gabriela, Stefan, what do you think? Why is lifelong learning not working? Gabriela? No, go, go, go ahead, Stefan. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I, would, I would build up on what um, Olga said. I think what always works is if there is not only a commitment, but also a forcing factor. But I think the forcing factor should come from all parties. If you look to um, studies done by the European Commission, on the motivation to do lifelong learning. If I now put myself into the shoes of, um, of a skilled or non-skilled person, we see that only probably 23% of skilled people are actively going and, try and do lifelong learning. If you go to non-skilled, it's almost, I, would, I think it's 8.7% that come and say, I want to do something. And I think here we need to almost require a lifelong learning from companies for individuals and 
from governments and institutions to really nurture that lifelong learning. Otherwise, I fully agree there will be a huge part of workers that we risk to leave behind, a side of technology that is instrumental to have access to knowledge. Gabriela. Yeah, I, I, was, I was going to add something that I consider to be key regarding um, lifelong learning, um, which is that 99% of, of, of the, the, the business world are SMEs. And uh, from my point of view, to reach SMEs through, I mean, to, to make them come into education is mm -hmm. super tough uh, because for um, employers to, to, of course, the, the cost of training, but also to, to, to lack of these human resources while they are in training is something. And uh, so we really need to take into account the, the, the business world of the SMEs mm -hmm. also, you know? But anyways, I, I, I wanted to add something about what Olga and Stefan said uh, regarding the, the, the pandemia, no? the, the, the need to adapt uh, education programs to the pandemia. And I, I would like to share our own experience with, with our different programs. We have a WBCSD education programs, of course, um, all related to sustainability. But uh, it was important that two of our programs, one is LEAP, the one I talked about before, uh, more than training programs, they are experiences. And um, of course, with the rest, we adapt it. And uh, with this uh, concrete programs I'm talking about, leadership and lead program, we adapt it as well. Um, we change one of the models to, to, to virtual. And let me say that it worked quite good because we did it uh, synchronous, you know, live. Mm -hmm. It was like being in the classroom with the 30 participants. But you miss, you know, like the shine in the eyes. Like when I'm talking about LEAP, if I was there in the scenario together with you, you could, you, I could transmit the shine in my eyes that you cannot really see it now. No? Mm -hmm. So it's quite tough. But of course, um, there are positive um, points from, from, from the pandemia or the, the virtual uh, education that it's driven uh, to, no? which is that you reach more people, no? More people that maybe people from Colombia and people from Singapore couldn't join together because traveling and, and that, that, that's really a, a point, I think, a positive point. Thank you, Gabriella. I'd like to hand over a question. I received during our event app, our Hoover app, um, and there is a question, what would be the importance of training visual intelligence and improved literacy levels to ensure reskilling and upskilling of workers towards a better future? Tough question, who wants to answer it? <laughs> uh, nobody, tough question, should we skip it? No, I, I think it's, um, it's um, one of the preconditions to, um, to do what we just discussed, the lifelong learning and, um, and what we have done um, during the pandemic is for free Fridays, which needs access. I totally agree with Olga. So we're always talking only for part of the population who has access, um, but free courses as knowledge is accessible I think that's one of the solutions and one of the pre-requirements to do lifelong learning. Thank you. Gabriella, what should companies do in order to have more women in senior positions? This is the next question I received. Okay, well, let me tell you that I took off my, my jacket just to fake that it's warm weather here in Spain. But if you could see through the window, it's raining so bad as if we were in, in, in Switzerland. So I guess we are, <laughs> adapting to the, we are adapting to the scenario, but at home it's, it's warm. Anyways, you look anyways, great, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would put the, the answer the other way. You know, the companies that are... are uh, having the best practices within gender uh, equality uh, issues are those who, who, who consider talent, mer merit, and, and personal capacity of individuals leaving aside gender, right? Those companies have a plan. Those companies set goals 
for instance, uh, work-life balance measures, not only for women, but also for men, to, to, to encourage their involvement, of course. There are companies that try to, to reach a equal representation at their governing bodies. But above all the measures or initiatives that I could say, I believe that uh, they should really believe in it. These companies don't need to just take a picture of five women and five men because it's, it's just a, a passing fad that they must join. No? They should really believe that gender equality adds value to, to, to their business. Thanks, Gabriela. Stefan, one more question. How does ADECO Group integrate UN sustainability goals as a company via their people and staff because the employees are also green ambassadors? Not an easy question, but... We have, we have um, taken the five, five goals and integrated it in our sustainability, in our sustainability initiatives and measures. Um, as I said earlier on, I think it's, it's probably a combination these days of realizing that sustainability is not only a sustainable way to do business, but it's also a competitive advantage. It attracts talents. That's why our CEO has set out not only carbon goals, HQ without waste, and then, and, and, but also on um, the diversity factor to say we want to have diverse teams in order to be competitive um, in the market and again to attract talent because we will see companies more and more smaller or bigger companies we need to be attractive for talents and I think that's the best way to have diverse and then to hardwire it into your, all your initiatives, be it the sustainability goals, um, yeah, and report back into the organization. I think that's what I would add to what Gabriela said. I would set clear goals, have the belief from the top to the bottom, but also hardwire and measure it, and then show best practices. I have two daughters. I think what's missing are role models that you have good role models that young, the young generation can look at and say, I want to do what this mm. woman or this man is doing. I think that's important too. Thank you so much. Gabriella, we got a comment. We love Gabriella for her hard work for women equality. Please continue. So that's what Thank I'd like to, very much. to hand over to you. Yeah. We're at the end of our panel talk. Thanks so much for the insights, for sharing your thoughts, your experiences with us. Thanks also to our viewers and our guests for yeah, being interactive, sending some questions to us. Hopefully see you next time at Future Talk all together in one event location. That would be great. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thanks so much for being part of Future Talk 2020. And goodbye from Switzerland, Thank from you. Bern. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Healthy. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. We are in Bern, the wonderful and beautiful capital of Switzerland right now. We stream to the whole world, just uh, to Spain, to Korea and so on. And we are very delighted um, to have the mayor, Mr. Grafen Reed, with us today. And he will share with us his views of smart cities and the meaning of greening cities. I want to welcome the mayor of Bern, Alec von Grafenried. This is your stage. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you very much for this uh, warm welcoming. Uh, welcome to Bern, wherever you are. Welcome to Future Talk. Uh, I heard it rained in Spain. Uh, we have bright weather here in Bern. I just come from a, uh, from a swimming in the river uh, in my lunch break, so uh, I hope you will uh, be able to come to Bern soon and to... Uh, <coughs> to take advantage of, of, the, uh, of the possibilities of our city uh, very soon. I am pleased not to see you, but I hope you are there somewhere, 
wherever you are uh, and you're willing to change, change the way we think about the future and change the role of smart cities. So I welcome you, uh, all experts, wherever you are online. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, uh, I was invited to, to talk about lifelong learning and the effort to become a, a smart city, a smart capital city. Uh, and the city of Bern, of course, is trying to become more and more smart and uh, a more and more smart city. So um, how do, you, do these two issues match with each other uh, to become uh, uh, a smart strategy, our climate strategy and a smart city? Uh, strategy. So let's first focus on, on the topic of smart cities. I'm convinced that a smart, innovation-friendly city will only be successful if it generates added value for its uh, citizens, for its people. This means that all people living and working in a smart city should benefit from it, even if they don't notice it. The goal must be that new technologies make the di daily life easier. For example, for example, I myself, I just uh, learned a couple of months ago how to bill, how to, how to pay my bills with my mobile mobile phone. It's so quickly done. It's so easy. So I just love it, and that's how innovation should be uh, achieved. So, <clears throat> Burn, for instance, is introducing a new platform for multimodal transport. It's called umove.ch. CH is for Switzerland. With one app, you get access to the bike rent renting system, car sharing system, and public transportation system. So it's no need to have any longer separate apps for every means of transport. And with just one click, you can organize your uh, trip uh, with any transport mean uh, you, you'd like to, or the app tells you to, to, to use because it's the best use of, of, uh, of transport. So traveling around will get a lot easier. Well, at least once the pandemic is over. The key word is convenience. Smart solutions have to be smart, of course, and they have to be convenient. In, in Swiss German, we call it gabig. They have to be gabig. Uh, Gabic is uh, everything that is Gabic. Everybody li likes things that are Gabic. Uh, in German, it would be praktisch. Uh, so this is convenience. Nudging strategies may help to get people to consume green energy. If solar energy is the default option, individuals hesitate to contact their energy provider to switch to other options, and as studies show. Little by little, we can make the world better, greener, and smarter. So how strong is our ability to change? This depends on the issue and, of course, uh, on the grade of emotional involvement. As a mayor, I've met a lot of youngsters here in Bern with high involvement who fight for climate change. It's uh, all over Europe. Uh, we, we know the youth for, for climate change. Uh, I, of course, as I'm a member of the Green Party, I understand very well their urgency to act now, and Bern has a, a long tradition for promoting sustainable uh, development. And in the age of digitalization, now we have new instruments to achieve uh, these goals. We can measure better, we have a lot of little sensors, uh, and we, we can share live data uh, immediately. For instance, Switzerland invented something like the 2000 Watt Society. What is the 2000 Watt Society? 2000 Watt. Uh, is for 24 hours, uh, 365 days a year, uh, a society use, uses 2,000 watt a person. Uh, this is a sustainable use, energy uh, use. This is the energy use that uh, uh, all over the world has been used in the year of, uh, of 2000. And we had to get back to the energy use of the year of 2000. And 2000 watt society all over the world shows us how we can achieve that. 2000 watt will, would be uh, one ton of, uh, of CO2 uh, carbon consumption. Um, and this is divided down to the individual. So the individual can understand uh, how energy consumption can be reduced 
to a sustainable level. And I think this is very uh, pedagogical and, and a very, very uh, clever way to show people um, how they can change their energy consumption. Because if you talk of terawatts, uh, who knows what a terawatt uh, is and, and how, how many O's you have to add to, to get to uh, tera, uh, tera billion. <clears throat> so everybody of us has the potential to adopt to the new reality as we learn. The virus, of course, changed our life and our behavior in a few months. And I think we learned so much about uh, epidemic, pandemics, uh, viruses, uh, and I think this learnings all over the world are so impressive that we should uh, make a learning ourselves. How can we bring all those informations, all the, this huge amount of in information in a short amount of time to the whole population of the world? And now you can go to uh, Australia or South America or Asia. To, you can talk about uh, virus epidemiology, uh, pandemic, and everybody will understand and everybody will, will explain you infection rates and, uh, uh, and the, the, the way viruses um, uh, are spread over the, the, the world. And the, everybody learns so much about a pandemic. And I think this is, should be a great pattern, how we could learn about, for instance, climate change or, for instance, other challenges we face in our uh, world. I'm convinced that the smart city has the pot potential to influence the way we live and we learn in the future. And we have to use this opportunity wisely. Otherwise, smart cities will be nothing else than just another uh, label. It's therefore necessary to identify where the greatest potential of real sustainable development lies for our society and for our future. We all have to understand why we have to act now and why we have to act together. So let's discover where our future strengths and talents are. Personally, I'm dreaming of a digital society combined with achievements like sustainable de development combined to our democratic system and, of course, the rule of law. We therefore call Bern a city of participation and we also uh, try to live this pattern of a city of participation. We try to involve everybody in order to bring them to, a more, to more self-responsibility. Uh, and I'm convinced myself that we have to include everybody to become e even stronger. So the mo most important task for this is to leave no one behind. Until today, in innovation, we often uh, face parallel solutions. So, so we always had, had pa in parallel an analog solution, the old analog solution, and then we had uh, aside the new digital solution uh, to leave no one behind. And I think we should change that pattern and we are about to change it here uh, in Bern. We have to go to single digital solutions, but we also have to give access to everybody to these solutions. So for instance, my, my uh, the example of digital payments with a, uh, with a mobile phone, we now have offices in each neighborhood. These can be uh, neighborhood offices or post offices or offices in, uh, uh, in homes for elderly people um, where there is assistance. So we have a terminal and we invite people to do their uh, payments digitally on, on those terminals, but they are assisted. And maybe they get uh, curious and uh, they will like the easiness of, uh, of paying digitally and more and more, maybe even they, we can get them to, to, uh, to have their own mobile phone and in a certain time to, to make their payments, digital payments um, themselves. So <coughs> I, I think we should go away from dual parallel systems just to digital systems and to assist people to use the digital uh, system or digital uh, solution. Innovation is very important to me, to a city, to, to get forward, and a smart city gets as smart as its people. So we need creativity, 
and a dialogue to bring in new bright solutions. That's why we created the digital days. We just had the digital days here in Bern uh, in the beginning of, of the week. Uh, a festival of smart solutions, of learning labs and innovative talks, and we had a great participation of our citizens in our digital days uh, festival. To sum up, I'm very optimistic concerning the role of smart cities for a sustainable development and fostering innovation. I'd like to thank the World Deduct Association for organizing this conference here in Bern, uh, even if you're not here, but you saved a lot of fossil fuels by staying home. Thank you for that. And in our hybrid world, it's very important to <coughs> connect like-minded people to discuss the potential of smart cities, of dis disrupting technologies, of hypes and hopes. Let's see where this discussion will lead us. I'm very optimistic. Thanks for your attention, and I wish you a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks so much to the mayor of Bern, Alec von Grafenried, for being here today, for sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks for being part of Future Talk 2020. Thank you so much. I'd now like to give the floor to the Vice President of the World Tech Association for some closing remarks and some takeaways. Uh, Nader Imani, there he is. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mayor uh, von Grafenried, um, dear participant. What a rich afternoon in terms of experience sharing and uh, speakers that they have been giving us the ideas about uh, how we can make our world more green, more resilient. Um, I think the greening of existing occupations should be on the agenda of education policymakers um, and educators in our education systems. To be considered in terms of upscaling, reskilling, I mean, this wording has been quite a couple of times mentioned by many of our participants and speakers this afternoon but also of education reforms, the requirements for education to go through these reforms to make the education more resilient and also answering to a resilient world. And greening areas such as renewable energies, energy and resource efficiency, and, and natural resource management. Green jobs, green skills, competencies, learning objectives, a curriculum will be defined and sustained by innovative learning solutions. So to do support all that, uh, we, we will need probably talents, quite a, quite a good of numbers of that, talents with necessary foundation in terms of knowledge, in terms of attitude, but also values. Education reforms on TVET for green and sustainable economies will have its maximum impact for success if, but only if, the gaining attitude and values are further resulted respectively from secondary and primary education, the foundation. Greening economy shall be reflected throughout the entire education system, quite holistically. The call for greening skills, green economy for less if not no impact on climate change are about managing expectations. Expectations that could be generational, which we must also have to address to. I would like to take a certain number of codes that have been really mentioning through the afternoon. Mrs. Kirchenknopf, representing the government states of Switzerland, that has been giving us the, the examples of, of growing uh, the building sectors, the construction sectors, by establishing a green certifications. Mr. Cohn from the Korean Embassy showing us how education could be transformational to really bring one society to the new society, as it has been the example of the, of the Korean case. But also to make the society more responsible, more, so more, more, more resilient. Mrs. Choi, um, that has been asking a call for action to really turn the world to growth, but also with regard to transformations and innovation, using TVET as an example. Mr. Avikan, representing the private sector, 
that has been really benchmarking the private sector the, as Hilti, one of the major global leaders around the globe, that's searching for alternatives for resources, um, for raw materials, to ensure sustainability and profitability of the company. But not only this, it has been also mentioned later on, how to be a world-class employer's brand, brand for, for a new generation, to be just simply more attractive for talents. In the panel one, it has been mentioned by Mr. Hart, reduce, reuse and recycle, and uh, I like it. Triple R, very simple. How TVET could really help to develop locally qualified human resources for further investments, also in the green economy. It has been also mentioned by, by Mr. Arini that engagement from the private sector, very much important, um, that the local solutions could be part of the real solutions just listening to the local voice. Mrs. Mani, that needs for multi-stakeholders and partnerships, that is really also important to have a dialogue um, as an inclusive one, an inclusive dialogue. Uh, Mr. Ruan from Nestle, Mrs. Muran from Nestle, that has been really also asked, mentioning the meeting customer needs all around the globe, to have zero emissions and zero waste. In the panel two, we have been listening to quite extensive uh, informations and experience sharing. Mr. Howe, that was really talking about need for social contact to, to contract, to establish a lifelong learning, and that shift building bridges to the future, <laughs> leaving no one behind. It has been also mentioned again. Mrs. Um, Stryetska Elina from uh, ILO, talk, talking about transition to circular economy, such important nowadays uh, statements for our economy of tomorrow, to many jobs that are really disappearing because of the fossil and the brown economy, but also at the same time that the green economy has the power to create even more jobs that are really disappearing. But the instrument or the catalyst for that would be probably TVET or education as a whole. Also, the need for the private engagement in terms of PPP or public-private partnership. And last but not least, Mrs. Uriate, that has been talking about women, women that for more productivity, more uh, competitiveness, uh, more sustainability in terms of, uh, of uh, our achievement of SDGs, uh, but also a positive side of the pandemic that she has been mentioning that while well, pandemic is also forcing us to change and to think differently because of that change. Well, to face our future, let's keep the window of opportunity wide open. Innovative technologies such as core elements of Industry 4.0 or circular economy will offer more to reach in production, management, and conversion of energy energy storage and distribution, as well as its intelligent usage. While our natural resources will be managed with smart processes to secure decent life for all, leaving no one behind. Just to change our blue planet every day, every time greener. We invite the world of policymakers, business, and education to act greener for our future. Thank you for our participation and interest. Our back to you, Doro. Thank you, Nader, for the closing words. Thank you very much. Yes, dear viewers, ladies and gentlemen, dear excellencies, we are at the end of the second day of Future Talk 2020, live from Bern. Thank you very much for joining our event virtually or live on site here in our event location. Hopefully, you enjoyed the day. In my opinion, we had a great day. We had two interesting panels, the private sector talk and so many insights in the green education field. And you all know the phrase, all good things are 
three. One more day to go. Tomorrow we will focus on artificial intelligence. For sure, we also have uh, interesting persons joining us via Zoom or here live in Bern. We will um, have speakers, we will have panelists. We also um, will have the private sector talk um, with Mr. Stutz uh, from Festo Didactics. So hope to see you tomorrow. Stay tuned. Um, yeah, until our last day at Future Talk here in Bern. Bye bye and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you.